Today's episode of This Is Only a Test is sponsored by Autodesk Graphic. Graphic is a full-featured app for making icons, illustrations, UI and UX, or anything else you need out of a professional vector design app. Open, edit, save raster or vector images, layered Photoshop or Illustrator files, CSS, SVG, PDF, and just about any other file format you can think of. You can open an AI file and export it in clean CSS code or web-ready SVG with just a few clicks. It's available on your Mac, phone, iPad, so you can design without compromise on the go, and it's the vector design app you've been waiting for for your iPad Pro and Apple Pencil. Visit graphic.com to learn more about Autodesk Graphic or just find it in the App Store. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, September 22nd, 2016, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Bass player. How you guys doing? All right. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's been a very uh, busy, 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 busy week. I am not doing well. No? I'm going to come out there and say oh, it. No. I am mad at the entire nation of Canada. They can go back to Canada <laughs> where they belong. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. What, what is Canadian? I, I was just in Canada, and I can tell you they're all really nice people. Yeah. Every That's what makes one. it worse. When when they rob you of your rightful entitlements and do it with a smile. What, does this have something to do with hockey? It definitely has something to do with hockey. Wait, what? So Kishore, Hari, and Jeremy Williams, of course, are co-hosts this week. Kishore, why are you mad about uh, Canadian hockey? So right now there's one of the better hockey tournaments happening that no one is watching called the World Cup of Hockey. It's six teams uh, from around the world uh, playing in a short tournament. And Canada, by far and away, the best team in the world – uh, eliminated the USA last night. Oh, mm. National teams. Ah, so it, hockey season is not going on. Has not it started starts yet? in October? Okay, got it. So it's just like basketball. After baseball's done, winter comes. Hockey starts. Right now is the right time for national pride to preseason hockey tournament. Well, it's a totally made up tournament that's just a money grab, but oh, okay. what they do is they take the best players in the world that are usually spread out on 30 teams and put them on 6. Uh. Um because you have so much more talent in such a smaller place, the kind of hockey is played is better. And because they're playing under their country's flags, they tend to play just a little bit harder than what you would see in like a normal regular season hockey game. What proportion of the best NHL players are just Canadians that play on U.S. teams. Uh, most, most, yeah, yeah. But so why is this not? Why is this surprising? It's not surprising. I just want. I I would like for once to beat the Canadians mm. at yeah. something other than everything. Yes, <laughs> I want to beat them in literally everything and take away the one thing that they have over us. Come on, man! They just they have hockey. Give them hockey. Never. Give, give them hockey. Um, there's a great children's song called um, They Have Hockey Song, written by a Canadian, where the chorus is all about is every kind of possible hockey that you could possibly think of. I know this song. Air hockey, ball hockey, barn hockey, bubble hockey. And he goes on and on. They play all of this hockey. Bubble hockey is the greatest hockey of them all. What's bubble hockey? Oh, you know, it's like the big plastic dome that you put a quarter in and then you control your players. Uh, it's like foosball. Yeah, but. But hockey, because the tiny puck can fly. Yeah. And, and scuff the inside. Uh, you know, speaking of those games, uh, when I was in Vegas two weeks ago, my friend took us to MGM Grand, where they have on the casino floor uh, one of the few mechanical horse racing games that you put quarters in. And I think there are only like half a dozen of these in the world. But how do you control them? So... You don't. Uh, you're betting on mechanical horses. Oh, you're betting. Yeah. So it's like a quarter, and then there's like this is the only place where you can. There's like a quarter machine. It's almost like an arcade, uh-huh. uh, but it, of course it's gambling. You put your five bucks in, get twenty quarters, uh, tw- twenty quarters, twenty quarters, and then you um, put it into this 
old machine, and it looks like um, maybe the size of a pool table, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a plastic dome over it, and then you see, uh, I want to say six or more tiny horses, mechanical uh, horses around a, a track, and they run around the track, and you bet on um, the first two, first place and second place, yep. and they show you the odds for every every run. But so. What causes one horse to go faster than another, and isn't the same horse always first if it's no. if it's mechanical? I so it's a mechanical action, but I think it's still randomized. Some random it, nature, you know, skewed toward the casino uh, on the on the. But the whole apparatus is a a mechanical action. Did and you yeah. win? No, it was it's a, it's a place to spend five bucks in half an hour to watch tiny mm-hmm. robot horses and. Go around a, a track. I'm gonna see if I can find. Um, it's the horse track of the future. Yeah, uh, robot horses. Yeah, it's a horse racing slot machine, and it's called a uh, Sigma Derby. If you Google this, it's an electro mechanical horse race used for gambling, made by Japan, and introduced in 1985. Five horses. Is anyone surprised that it was made in Japan? Not at all. No. But I, I played it and I thought, oh, I think Jeremy would like this. Yeah, I want to know how it works. I want to because you can always set those things up, right? Like right. The operators always have a toggle for how much payout do you want, right? And and like what the what the house advantage is exactly. And they say the typical house advantage is ten twenty percent, uh, which is terrible. But you're also and you're betting quarters at a time, and I, mean, I guess you could bet more. If yeah. You wanted to press more, but it's like this old old gambling machine, the Sigma Derby. I thought it was one of the. the, the most fun things to do in Vegas without losing a ton of money. Uh, it, it was a fine way for me to spend spend an afternoon with a beer. I just wish it was it was full scale. Yeah, these are robot horses. When you say robot horse, I want a full sized robot horse. Yeah, that sounds like a tested project to me. The, I, the whole time I was thinking, like, how would you go about <laughs> building this? Yeah, right. Because you want the mechanic, and then, and I think the thing that charmed me the most mm-hmm. was the mechanical action of the horse. Because these are like tiny horses, metal horses on rods, but they had a spring system, so they looked like they were galloping. So there was a nice little mechanical action for the, the horse to, yeah. to move around the track. I, I want this to be like at a bar, and every one of the bar has these two track and field style arcade buttons in front of them. And then they can, rather than it being random, mm-hmm. who wants that? That you want to ride a horse, and the f- the person who's fastest on the on the buttons is so some type of tap tap revolution yeah. it's the, rhythm game. Then you can put it in any state as long as it's not a game of chance. Look out, Golden Tee. You know why Williams, the greatest pinball manufacturer of all time, stopped making pinball machines? Why? Because they made a lot more money making slot machines. Oh. Freaking gamblers. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. That was my Vegas story. I don't know how we got there. Do we need to pop back up? I don't have that handy. I think we just need to. I need to. I think we just need to go to a whole new segment. Oh, <laughs> you <laughs> you want to move on to pop culture already? Let's do it. Pop culture. <laughs> Did you watch the Emmys? You know, I didn't. I only followed it on online after the fact. I had it on in the background while I was working. Didn't you, didn't the Emmys come up on Still Entitled this week? It did, and it was those were the Schmemmies, uh, the science. Emmy, oh, the Creative, creative Arts, Arts Emmys. Emmys. Yeah. So <laughs> Adam calls them the Schmemmies. I think that's what it is, right? The Science and Creative Art yeah. Emmys. Yeah. Uh, and Emmys were split across three days. Two day, There are over a hundred different awards given out for all the different various Emmys. The one that I guess mainstream uh, primetime cares about is the third day, the primetime Emmys, which was this past Sunday. That's to give awards to TV shows, increasingly web shows and um, over uh, Netflix-style subscription-based shows for which many, many won. I think the big winners were um, Game of Thrones, obviously. Uh, Mr. Robot was a big winner. Well, mm-hmm. Remy Malek won Best mm-hmm. Actor, best, right? Best Actor. Is uh, he the star of? Yeah. 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 Um, Orphan Black, lead actress. Won. Oh, Tatiana Maslany totally deserved that for as many characters as she plays in that show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was uh, the O.J. Simpson 
Oh yeah, uh, I didn't watch that. I didn't watch that series series either, but apparently that won a bunch of awards. Uh, but also, um, Pat Oswalt won. That was the best moment of the night. Pat Oswalt uh, for his Netflix special, which uh, for anyone who follow his career, that special and his life air or was released on Netflix just like a day before his wife passed away, and so it was. I mean, it was a hilarious special, but it's tough to watch that again. Um, given the context of that. But he gave a, gr- gave a great speech. There was also a Facebook post he made a couple months ago about grief because it's it's obviously been tough for someone and, who's brought so much joy to the world. And trying to write jokes again, which mm-hmm. is what his profession is. Yeah. Amidst that, um, it, uh, he, it was touching speech, and then backstage he elaborated on it because you have to go face the press uh, with this award in your hand, and it, he was full of grace when he did it. And then in true Patton Oswalt style, if you follow him on Twitter, there's a shot of him at the end of the night outside of an Arby's with like a half drank bottle of whiskey, which is just truly delightful to partake in. Uh, and I think his message was like, I made it to the Emmys after party. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did Stranger Things win anything? It didn't. That's and I, the thing that I thought was interesting was that Stranger Things for such a phenomenon that it was – in our world, mm-hmm. the, the kind of pop culture uh, geek world, uh, it was relegated to a stage bit where the, the cast of Stranger Things weren't even invited as like, I don't think that they attended as audience members. They performed a bit where they gave out sandwiches to the, that Jimmy Kimmel's mom made or something, right, to the, to the crowd. I think they were past the deadline for this uh, year. I wondered if they were in the window. Okay. Uh, so, so I, maybe next year, but then yeah. it's gonna be too late because there'll be so much, so many more shows, and I hope it doesn't get forgotten. I don't think it'll be forgotten. I mean, the Emmy is kind of insular still because we still like Julia Louis Dreyfus wins like every year. It feels like and deserve it. Veep is an amazing show, but um, they haven't branched out from like a, a comfortable area. You know, Game of Thrones winning everything ever. It like shows how the Emmys are still in this comfort zone. Have they a lot. have they won everything ever for the past few years? Yeah, they yeah. D- tend to just crush the Emmys. Um, uh, you got to Google Eleven rapping to Nicki Minaj if you haven't seen that. It's I have not amazing. She's oh, a, she's on the uh, t- was, it was on t- the late tonight night show. Shows? Yeah, and and it's just fantastic. She does this. Um, I don't even know Nicki Minaj, but I that's the, this is the only reason I like Nicki and Minaj is because of this clip. Got to Google that. She raps to Monster. Yeah, it's a little NSFW. But, but she, she knows it so well, like she censors herself perfectly. Is this one of those uh, the karaoke? What are, what are the celebrities? No, they're sitting around a table, too. all the kids from the show, and they have crazy string that shoots out of cans at each other, and they're playing some kind of a game. And the only clip I saw from it is this one. It's worth watching. Hell, those kids are really they're good friends in in real life. Which oh, I, that's I amazing. Would, hope would be the case. I uh, slightly prefer Adele's rap version of that Nicki Minaj. Does song. she do that? Yeah, really. Oh. Okay. Um, a season sorry. Uh, one and he and his writing partner uh, Alan Yang, I want to say, won best writing for uh, Master of None, which awesome and love that show. Uh, hopefully, do you watch it, Jeremy? No. Master Nun is great. I mean, it it touches like kind of a very personal place for me because growing up uh, as an Indian American, he touches on a lot of themes like with parents and and culture that are were incredibly relatable to me. But I think it was a a great series. Norm, as you said, even if you didn't grow up exactly in that um, that world, yeah, you're caught in the middle, Jeremy. You're caught in the middle. What's it like to be a white man in the middle <laughs> of us? A- um, so, uh, anything else from the Emmys, uh, that, that were, I'll just say Jimmy Kimmel was actually pretty good, you know, for uh, everyone talks about the host effort. He's pretty funny and self-deprecating and Matt Damon roasting him on stage was probably one of the best moments of the night. Mm. Uh, did you see the, that they also posted a, on Facebook, a 360 video of, I believe the opening montage. Uh, and that's one of the, the hmm. fun things about you know, these type of highly produced shows, whether it's the Emmys or the Oscars or the Golden Globes, done in the world of social media. Uh, it really, you get this, you can experience it in so many different ways. You can watch it the, the way it's produced for, which um, is TV, but increasingly it's also being produced in all these other mediums, uh, whether it's for social media or 360 video, or different experiences. So I watched, the only thing I did watch, because I didn't watch it on TV, was the 360 version that they, I believe they shot with the new GoPro uh, 360 rig. And because you can see a shadow of it in the corner, uh, and also 
like fun things you could see like when you're watching a 360 video is what's being projected because the show is being live mixed like what's being projected on the TVs and apparently someone tweeted out that in during commercial breaks it's NFL you're <laughs> kidding yeah <laughs> they, they switch the big giant TVs the, the big projection screens that normally show the live mix so that's yeah. how the audience knows to laugh when they focus in yeah. on another actor or actress um, but that gets changed they, someone changes the channel to football keeps people in their seat yeah yeah the other thing I, I, I noticed is that people like well, they were handing out those sandwiches for that gag where like Jimmy Kimmel's mom made the audience member sandwiches and the kids from Stranger Things handed them out and there's like a napkin with like a little note and the people who received the sandwiches all tweeted pictures of their sandwich and that note. Those notes were not handwritten. They were printed Wait, you on don't, the napkin. You don't think it's really from his mom? I don't think I don't not only do I not think it's from his mom, I don't think even someone took the time <laughs> to write out the notes that they were just printed napkins. For consistency. You would think that would actually take more time. I know. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why can't these get get someone to write out the note? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I think that's enough about the the Emmys. Uh, lots of exciting TV. I, get, I think a big trend, and we've seen this. It's not new this year. Is that it's about a lot of shows that aren't on cable or even on broadcast television that win awards. Uh, it's these pay services. I guess HBO we can consider that's cable, but. That's almost like the in between between like a, a dedicated Netflix or Hulu style show. It's specifically not cable. It's not uh, even uh, that's TV. Right. It's not TV. It's HBO. Yeah. Uh, but, and one of those shows that's highly anticipated from people in this room is going to be on CBS All Access: Star Trek Discovery. Okay, now tell me seriously: is this highly anticipated? I yes, for highly for me. Yes, yeah. yes. you? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Great, man. Because yes. that, that, well, that CG teaser looks shite. <laughs> well, there have been no casting announcements yet. Nothing more since than what they loosely talked about at Comic Con this year in, in terms of what era it's going to be. The fact that it's going to be uh, not in the J.J. Uh, Abrams J.J. Um, verse or the Kelvin verse, whatever they call it, call it now. Um, but they pushed the release of that show, the premiere, till mid twenty seventeen, May twenty seventeen. We have to fix the CG. I'm yeah. also kind of surprised that we don't even have any basic casting information at this point yeah. for a show that's coming out that soon. I know eight months sounds like a long time, but like casting. If they done? really believed in the show, wouldn't they put it on network TV? No, because I think the m- way they get money for this show, yeah. it was to as a way to bolster their Netflix competitor. So you, you buy CBS All Access, guess what? You get all the episodes of The Big Bang Theory and also some new content in the form of the okay. Star Trek Discovery show. Uh, the first, the pilot, or whatever they end up shooting as the pilot, the first episode, will be broadcast on CBS. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I think they've done the market research. They know that the people, I mean, one, it's probably gonna be a highly pirated show, but two, like, maybe it's it's that extra incentive for people to pay $10 a month, and on CBS, on primetime, they, they're still gonna make more ad monies making NCIS. They discovered people who know what Klingons are also stream use streaming services. That's right. So I went back and I looked at what the premiere numbers for shows like TNG were like. Yeah. 11 million people watched the premiere of TNG. There is no way they're going to no, hit that number. No way. Again, Star Trek in the 90s, it was, as we talked about last week, was a legitimate cultural phenomenon and mainstay of, of American households. Uh, but going back to CG, let's not re- judge a show, a sci-fi show especially, just based on the spaceship CG. Uh, I- I'm very apologetic for anything that's considered a teaser trailer. Like, I feel like that that's what that was. And so, yes, it did not look good, but eh, I, I don't care right now. But also, no Star Trek show has had great CG. CG. Good CG, good space action in a Star Trek anything is like a, a like lovely little treat. Um, <laughs> I would rather they spend the money on building the sets. Build out some great interiors of starships. Yeah. Do you want a different area of the ship? Yeah. Because we're so used to getting yes. bridge engineering. Yes. I mean, we're talking about massive starships that are, you know, the equivalent of you know, you know, battleship ooh, or, you know, cruise ships in, in modern day, right? You, you got your bridge, you got engineering, you have uh, the rooms, housing, 
and then you maybe have one public shared space. I don't know, man. That's a lot of sets for a show that they don't even believe in enough to put on network television. I mean, because they, they have to do all the away missions. Like, that's where they're putting their money is on those. Screen screen. Oh, yeah. Vancouver. Yeah. It's, yeah, I trust these Vancouver. guys to do great green screen. Yeah. <laughs> go, to, go to Greenland. I know a place. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I hope it's more on the strength of storytelling. I know that for immersion purposes, even shows like The Expanse have incredible production values. Yeah. But the space stuff, I don't think you need to spend a ton of money on. Well, not nowadays. You're right. But th that's kind of where my expectations are, is that nowadays CG is so inexpensive. Not, I mean, obviously, compared to where it was 20 years ago, fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like 20 years ago, it would have taken hours and hours to render this stuff, multiple people. Now it's just, it's off the shelf and it's, you know, people are coming out of school with degrees everywhere and it should be a lot less expensive and a lot easier to make. Do we fault shows like Battlestar Galactica for setting an expectation of high, you know, ship on ship, dogfighting action, fat, you know, big virtual zooms? I didn't watch and, it, but wasn't Babylon 5 doing that too? Babylon 5 was doing it a little I, bit. I started re-watching Babylon 5. It does not look good. No, that that it, was, I agree with and you. And Battlestar Galactica, those scenes that you're referring to, also I don't think look very good yeah. um, when you rewatch it. I don't think it holds up. A lot of these things don't hold up well. Though I will say, I do think Voyager towards the end and DS9, it looked okay because you always got like three seconds or ten seconds of, of ship battle. So I'm with Norm. I don't think you need a lot of it. No, I yeah. mean, think of TNG, which is so rewatchable, and so much of it is just based on a few sets, not even the, the capital episodes. Here comes a cube moving slightly forward on exactly. the screen. Or here comes the same, sh the same uh, motion-controlled shot of the Enterprise-D, the, the, the wood model that they painted, against a, a planet, a different planet. I think I'm, I mentioned that I'm watching, rewatching the first season, right, with my son. Yeah. Um, he's watching it for the first time. We're loving it. He can't wait every night to get to, to an episode. Uh, but every CG element seems to have been retouched, right, for the remaster. Yes. Is that right? HD, yeah. Did they actually go back and re-render things and no, start from scratch? they created new planets. They did? Yeah. Okay, because yeah. it's really sharp. Because all they have were the, the masters of the green screen effects. So the ships look just as good. Um, it wasn't like when they remastered the original series where they CG created CG ships because they didn't have that oh, film. Oh, I see. Okay. Is this ship fully CG, or did they make a practical version? For Discovery? No one knows. I think for the teaser, it's clearly a, yeah. it, 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 a CG thing. I hope there's a practical I know. version. Spend money on one practical ship. It's and, the ship! And, and, and make the ship, shoot it a couple of times from different angles, and then composite in planets. And that gives a more of a vibe, like the way that you kind of have that of uh, the the static ship shot cruising by a planet. I don't think we need the kind of Battlestar Galactica um, type action shots. Uh, the, the I had one more thing to say and, and about Star Trek Discovery, about Star Trek Discovery and the way those shows are shot. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I'm with you. I'm gonna watch it. Maybe I'll have a watching party. Yeah, I'll come to your thing. watching party. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I'll be the grumpy Muppet in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> the Waldorf. You, you can put a little <laughs> suit and sit in the balcony. Yeah. Yeah. A um, couple new trailers came out for yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, yes. Passengers, a show we, uh, a movie we talked about with Chris Pratt and Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence, Lawrence uh, where they're on a hibernation ship and they're the only ones that wake up. Uh, Joey's not around, right? I can talk about trailers. You can absolutely <laughs> talk about trailers. I can talk about trailers. Please, please. The trailer is is actually pretty good. It starts off as a rom com trailer, mm. and so it's kind of delightful that, and then it completely switches gears. Um, I, I I like those stark alone in space type uh, operas, so I'm hoping this will be that with a little bit of Chris Pratt throwing in. I didn't like the trailer. Oh. Oh no! I didn't like the trailer, and and maybe it's because I love the script so much. I already had a vision in my head of what it was going to look like, um, but I thought the trailer made it seem too much like an action film, and and didn't have some of the darker elements that the psychological dark elements that that I, I thought made the script so great. Uh, the thing I did think that was realized really well was the the bartender. Yeah, Martin the shining Shane. little. Now, and when I off. read the script, in my head it was Morgan Freeman, but I think um uh Martin Sheen, Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen, Michael Sheen, who they got uh, I thought was did, does a perfect job uh, at least from the trailer that, of playing how at least it was written, the kind of smiling uh, almost uh Fallout era style, you know, robot bartender. 
So comparing this to another show that's coming, that's sort of this, you know, I w- almost dystopian future, I guess, will mm-hmm. be the emergence of Westworld. Oh my goodness. This is the only thing that I'm looking forward to. This is HBO, world. right? It, yeah. yeah, it's not TV. This looks <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, this looks awesome. And I have you ever seen Westworld? The original? Yes, I've seen both Westworld and uh, the follow-up, the sequel. And you know, both of those have uh, are milestones in computer technology. This is in the '70s films, right? '70s films. The first Westworld, when they cut to Yul Brenner, the gunslinger's vision, that pixelated view he had, the kind of heat map pixelated view of the world. That was the first time a computer effect was used to alter the image in film in film no kidding yeah the pixelation and then in the follow-up to westworld uh when they had uh the digitization of a human they had cg and i want to say that was after um wrath of khan which Mm. had the cg genesis planet which had that was pixar that was yep yep when they were back at lucas um, but both of the Westworld films have uh, uh, amazing, like for its time, CG. Hmm. I thought the Abyss was the first CG element like that with the water creature. The Abyss was so the wa- much later. The water though. tentacle. A first CG character, maybe. Maybe. And that wasn't even the first CG character. First, I think, CG character was um, Indiana Jones TV show. Yeah, the, um, that's right. The, the stained glass window character, which also, I believe, was Pixar. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. So there are early reviews out because the show is premiering just in a couple weeks, right? October 2nd. Um, and it, uh, some people have seen the first four episodes. I have not. All, and all, I can't, I'm just going to Are you staying away? Much. No, I'm watching as much as I can. So you'll read every review? You, like... No, actually, I, I've watched every trailer, but I haven't read the reviews. Do you think it'll be darker than the original film? Yes. I hope so. So it's... do you know the conceit of the, the series? No. Okay, uh, let's go into spoiler territory. If you don't want to know and you want to go go into Westworld cold, uh, then for the next, let's say, four min- five minutes, skip forward. Wow, that's a lot. All right. Wow. Jeez, okay, let's go. <laughs> Get ready with the sound effects to bring us back. Though. All right. Um, so original movie based on the Michael Crichton book about a fantasy amusement park that, um, that people go in. It, it's a... It's a great satire on on technology in, in like Disneyland for adults, right? Because Westworld is just one of the environments in that story. Um, and it, it's all about hedonism. It's almost like it's an era of like Logan's Run and stuff like that, right? Um, in the new Westworld for HBO, uh, it's just one Westworld, one one environment. That's the only land. That's in the, the park. only land I believe in the park, um, and it's told primarily from the perspective of the robots that live in the park. What? Yeah, and what their life and what their consciousness is like. Because they're not holograms. Yeah. Just like in the original movie and book, they're robots. So the idea is that Anthony Hopkins created the universe and uh, Jeffrey, um, uh, the guy from James Bond movies who played the buddy, he was also in Source Code. Um, Anyway, he plays like the roboticist who creates the idea of how you can do synthetic humans. And so you have all, all these shots of like, this of these like you know blank slate humans that robots Jeffrey Wright Jeffrey Wright that's correct uh, and then they build them out they give them memories even like horses and like animals in that world and then they're robots but for maintenance the, they have to bring those robots back into their labs to one repair them and then two also psychologically program them and the robots experience those as dreams oh wow yeah, so they have nightmares. Oh wow! About going into the world, the real world, and I, I, I think obviously, like, just like the conceit of the, the movie, it's like everything must go wrong, right? There's ascensions to it or something, but it's about like what does it mean to be real, and and then of course they they have the protagonist who is um the guy from House of Cards and it's always sunny, um, and he goes into the West World and I'm sure he gets caught up in in the robots trying to kill him or, or hunt him down. Uh, Ed Harris plays Gunslinger, which I really I thought was it's great casting. So you're going to sympathize with the robots? I think they're trying to make, and I'm, I, there may be like an evil robot force, like the mm. Gunslinger, like as as a kind of, um, you know, just a force of nature moving mm-hmm. through the world. That's that like that Terminator aspect was a big part of the original Westworld. So I imagine they'll bring yeah. that back. Will this become how much can they reveal to humans that about their own thoughts, lest yeah. they be re- you know erased? Right, so uh, in all the trailers, you have um, the actress uh, who, uh, uh, I'm forgetting all the names today, um, but she's she's being interviewed by Anthony Hopkins, 
And she like, and he asked her, do you know where you are? And she's like, well, this is clearly a dream. And then you see her waking up in her Westworld world. And it's like beautifully shot. It's like a massive holographic yeah. world with people riding horses. So there's going to be drama there and also drama in the real world. Bring it on. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Nolan, uh, show running it. So he has a lot of, he's a good writer, a lot of good ideas. I never saw his last show, Person of Interest, but I heard it was a really good show. A lot of deep sci-fi fans really like that show a lot. Yeah. Hey, that was under the five minute mark. There you good go. job. Ooh. Passenger trailer looks great. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. With, yeah. with no audio? With no audio. <laughs> it's got great CG, I'll tell you that. You know, um, I think that movie is going to have a tough time. There's like a, a couple like twists in the movie, and the way it resolves is, I think, from, I thought it was beautiful, the, the, the resolution. But I think that the one key plot point in the movie, which they allude to in the trailer that will be revealed that creates tension, is going to be really tough for them to play gracefully without it being like, and, and I don't know if either of you want to know, but I'll talk to you guys after after the okay. podcast. Right. Um, Norm is like, you're now transforming to the to the person that I don't want to sit next to at a movie because <laughs> you're just like, arms folded. let me tell you about what the mm. book actually said, nah. and mm. I don't know about this I, twist. You know, I don't own a TV. <laughs> I don't watch TV. I watch HBO. <laughs> uh, I was watching uh, an old Wyatt Cenac comedy special um, from 2011. Uh, he was a correspondent on the, a Daily Show, and <laughs> he does this great bit about how he he's surrounded by friends who all claim they don't own TVs, and they're proud, so proud of the fact like they make an anniversary of the date that they threw out their TV and they stopped paying for cable, um, and then but. <laughs> But when they brings up like a show, like a popular show, they're like, "No, don't give me spoilers of the show." And like, Why would you care about the show? You don't watch TV. He goes, "Well, I watch my laptop." Yeah, you own a TV. Yeah, yeah. My kids call the TV a computer because it's all streaming. Really? It's because we're, we're cable cutters, so we, we don't have TV. Oh, that's <laughs> funny because I would consider. I mean, what I'm talking about is calling the laptop a TV. Yeah, it's you're talking about room. calling the TV a computer because yeah, they grew up with iPads and computers. Do they crave more interaction with the TV? As well, I don't computer? have any fingerprints on the TV, thank God. But <laughs> they, uh, I mean, it, it is interactive. Like I said, it's got like the Apple TV and PlayStation. They just think it's a computer. Huh. That's fascinating. Yeah. And those kids will never own cars. Well, they might. But they. My, my question is, if you have a self-driving car, do you still need a driver's license? Yes. I'm thinking yes, too. Yes. Yeah. So they will still have to go through that. Is that really just a test of... Of prove that you have the basic skills to be an adult. Right. Like if you can't parallel park, <laughs> you shouldn't be. <laughs> well, I mean, it's some, what, what if you don't own a car? What then? And you order a self-driving Uber, then you don't need a driver's license. Exactly, that's true. But if you own it, you do. Right. That's what I'm saying. Th- that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, it's a slippery slope because you the if you look back, you know, most cars are automatic transmission, and you don't need to know how to drive stick yep. to drive a car. Um, but but a lot of people would say you don't you know driving you're only really driving if you're driving stick and you understand the mechanics of transmission and what's going on right but that's obviously not a requirement now to get a driver's license so it may just be like you may need to do like three things you know you don't need to parallel park or maybe just pull over to the side know how to know how to press the gas and and brake and pull over to the side of the road in case of an emergency like that's all you need to be able to own a self-driving car how the hell did we get here well, the kids, you know, no. you never know with the kids. I think we're we're touching on a lot of technology, which means let's let's move on to our next segment. Oh, we're not. I see. I wasn't set up. There's another story we're skipping. No one will ever know. And I'll unmute the music before I play it. Delightful, delightful. You know that sound clip, that that um, music, yeah, would play great over the videos uh, from this new YouTube channel oh. that I've, um, I've I've discovered. And I mean, I didn't discover it, but it's I, been around for a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I just recently found out about it and have been binging. There's only like six or seven episodes. It's Macro Room. What's Macro Room? Um, so you know how there's there are channels now. For doing interesting things with cameras and technology, like whether it's slow mo guys for high speed cameras, 
Uh, they kind of pioneered that back in 2012 or 2010, whenever they start 2011-ish. Um, there's also uh, hydraulic press. Hydraulic press channel. Hydraulic press channel. Yeah, yeah. And, and lots then of followers lots there. Of, yep. And then uh, people doing all sorts of things, right? Like there's this guy who melts things. There's a guy who <laughs> stretches things. Everyone has like, a thing. Yeah. Right. But there's yeah. a site that tests things too. Yes. I heard about yeah. a good YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, well, this one, the Macro Room channel, they do uh, macro photography of things being melted. Oh, wow. Okay. Beautiful macro photography. And some of it's in time lapse, and some, some of it's, I believe, sped up i can't i can never really tell mm -hmm. but like they get really close to like keyboards or phones or even army men figures and put a blowtorch to it and the chemical re the reactions of things being melted um is just that's like interesting because there's a lot happening Absolutely. on a small scale it's like powers of 10 like you keep zooming in and it gets more and more interesting and not only is it uh, because from the macro view you can see a lot of detail like the bubbling is but when the most interesting stuff is when they melt things of uh, multiple materials. So if they melt a s small piece of, you know, a sign that had, where the letters are a different material than the surrounding material, then they melt at different temperatures. And so you see like, you see them separate. Yeah. And then pop out and it looks super, super cool. It's meticulous. Um, I like the pill dissolving. When mm. Yeah, no, so none of all of it's melting. That's right. You already knew about this, Kishore? I did. I've seen a few of these things. Our internet's down. Our right, internet check it out. currently is down right now. Thank goodness we're not streaming this live right now because <laughs> it would be a disaster. Uh, but you guys check it out, uh, Macro Room. That's my recommendation this week, my new discovery. Um, all right. Time to talk about power lacing shoes. Ugh. Okay. Uh, like, let's first acknowledge that it's a year too late. For yeah. self tying shoes, they tried to make these. Is it, this is Nike, right? This is the actual shoes yep. that they had Michael J. Fox promote um, last year. He teased, he teased, he them. teased it last yeah. year. Uh, and you know, Nike and their designers worked on the original Power Mags, the the prop for for Back to the Future Two, and it's it looks like they've been working on a system to do power laces, the Hyper Adapt system, um, for a while now. This and is it's oh. on the cover of Wired magazine. Oh my gosh. Um, the design issue and the way it works I understand it is that the laces are run through a motor that are in the sole of the shoe and that they can detect tension and, and tightness and when, when you put when you the shoe on it li if there are lights also lights in the back and lights in the bottom the laces tighten up and <laughs> it's, a, it's a comfortable fit it's really rough they missed last year because I, I don't think there's any. Do you not care about it at all? Like, like the the people would have cared about this last year. They I, would have sold these. They, they're still going to sell them. Uh, not they're like not last a prototype. Year. They're, but there's no practical reason to do this. P my, you know, people have Velcro if they want quick straps <laughs> or you know, slip-on shoes. Are you now. five? Slip-on shoes, loafers. Loafers are the, the reason that these are uh, – loafers are comfortable. I, well, no, I mean, my shoes are lace up, but I still slip them on. I just leave them laced up. Yeah, I mean, same here. And they don't look—they don't feel like they're gonna fall off at no. any time. Yeah, they're also you know hiking shoes where you can just pull the one lace, you know, the pull the pull the pull the lace it tightens up and then you slide the the, the lock in. That's smart. Or but you can or you can do what I do and use elastic laces that just conform oh, to that's your right. feet. That's right. Or elastic. Ela what? Yeah. Well, I don't have uh, those shoes on now, but I, I basically you can get elastic laces that just yeah. have the tension and they become slip-ons. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you don't need this motor in your soul. No, that's what I'm saying. Now, my question is, how does it actually change the wear of the shoe? Like, because it's big sole, it's like lifted off the ground. Yeah. Because they need space for the motor. Uh, what is maintenance like? What happens if power runs out? <laughs> like, these are all like questions it, I want to know the answers to. This isn't a shoe you wear out to walk around town. It's one to be seen in. Expect a high price tag. Everyone's going to want a demo everywhere you go. That's... You got to take your shoe <laughs> off and like unlace it. You got to have it. an extra pair. You're going to run out of power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they go Hang on. Sell. I can't take off my shoes. I have to charge them up. <laughs> For the loosen up the motors. Oh, You're no, like, too tight, too tight. You go to visit somebody's house where they don't have, they like make you take off your shoes. You can't take them off. Mm. Oh, it'll be great. The internet of shoes. Yeah. Now, wouldn't it make more sense for Nike to spend more money to t putting, if they're going to put technology in a shoe? Yep. You know, lacing seems like, because of the novelty of lacing, it's, it's going to get a lot of headlines, but spend the money on 
uh, biometrics on on uh, tracking um, yeah. like metabolism and tracking they, calorie. They already right? got they, they're already in that space. Like they've had yeah. the fuel band forever, and they have. Well, there's the, no fuel band anymore. They have the special uh, Apple Watch. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but they've been in that space longer than Apple. Yep. And uh, th- yeah, I'm surprised that they don't have that. And they, isn't it what athletes care about? Yeah. I know a lot of athletes love the the Nike the knit shoes because they're so lightweight. Oh yeah, and those are those are great. I mean, Breathable. They're they're also uh, they're what Matt Damon wore in The Martian. I didn't know also. that. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, the hyper gap there. They are a curiosity and the headline grabber, but it's I don't think it's the future of shoes. I'm happy to be proven wrong, and maybe five years from now, everyone's going to be wearing self lacing motorized shoes. Only one person wore them in Back to the Future Two, and he was a total geek, total nerd, right? I kind of hate. You don't the... think didn't Doctor Brown have them too? No. I don't know. Power lacing. All right. Oh, really? You think he had them too? <laughs> no, it was, it was just Marty. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going with just Marty. I kind of hate myself that the word future of shoes, the phrase future of shoes has been uttered. On this. No, no, I no. I feel like I, this I, is. No, the internet of shoes. Oh, that's even worse. The internet of shoes. All right, let's move is, on. All right. <laughs> all right. So that's not the big news. Um, so maybe we won't be wearing power lacing shoes in the future, but we most certainly will be driving self, uh, not maybe not self driving cars, but electric cars yes that's 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 a real thing it's real you know those documentaries who killed the electric car i never Take saw that. that have you seen that no okay i want to watch that one day i mean wouldn't it be great to watch it like in a year from now when you're driving an electric car yes and you're like we made it which if we things made it. if things go according to plan Take that. we can do because i have put money down on a chevy bolt wow wait what elon no no no, no. how elon. are we gonna get that elon you don't you want handwritten letters my feeling is like the thousand dollars down on these. they're just gonna be printed letters they're it's not like, gonna be handwritten it's like the same thing as putting it in my bank account which is not interest bearing it might as well go to like put me in line somewhere for that excitement factor so yeah i still have the the money down on the model three but if i love this bolt i'm gonna get that money back now wozniak i think we mentioned this he Said, I'm dropping out of the, I'm going to trade in my Model S and taking out and getting out of the Model 3 line, and I'm going to get a Chevy Bolt. So and not necessarily because awesome. it's a more power efficient or a more stylish ride. Uh, no. It's because he actually <laughs> likes the comfort of the interior. Yeah, yeah. He likes it. I assume the dashboard. He likes the tactile feel of that compared to the Model 3. And he, you know, he has to fit his Segways in the back somehow. That's right, and, you, and and that's a hatchback. Yeah, the the, the Chevy Bolt. You think uh, Elon and Jimmy Kimmel's mom both source their fake handwritten notes from the same company? <laughs> yes, mm. someone's cornered that market. Yeah. Uh, so Chevy Bolt, it's thirty thousand, thirty seven, well, thirty eight thousand dollars, thirty seven five, thirty seven five, which is exactly what we thought it would be, because they said it would be sub thirty after the federal income tax rebate. And the tax rebate, the fear, because as we all studied when the Model Three would come out, it's, it's only a limited time. Chevy obviously is going to get their uh, bolt out before the Model 3 comes out, yeah. so more people will be able to take advantage of the tax credit. Well, it has to do with how many ca- um, cars the manufacturer sells. Right. So the the cutoff for EVs is 200,000 cars. Mm. Chevy's already sold about 100,000 volts. volts. Which count. Yeah. Oh, they count against this, even though they're not fully electric? Right. And they have sold a, a certain number of Spark EVs. So... Yeah, you gotta. You want to be in on this first round of hundred thousand, mm. and you would hope that they are going to make a lot of bolts. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's, it's getting a, a token, lot of press. A and, like according to my dealership, they haven't seen this kind of interest in uh, for quite some time. Interest is very different than actual. What do you mean purchases, though? What do you mean your dealership? Have you been calling them up? Yeah, no. I as soon as like the press hit from CES this year, I went to the dealership. I test drove a Volt. I said, I like this. I think I'm going to try to be patient and wait for the fully electric Bolt later this year. And so that's what I've been texting him all year long. As so you, soon, you as have soon a as guy? They, yeah. As soon as they were taking pre-orders, I got the call. He said, now's the day. I, I went in the very next day. I'm number four in line. Uh, they're only taking, they only took 15 pre-orders. I think they're all filled now. Wow. Uh, because they don't have allotment. It's not like they don't have an actual company pre-order plan like, Tesla like did, Tesla. where Tesla now has 400,000 pre-orders. Right. Chevy Press release, local Bay Area, <laughs> Silicon Valley, 15. Chevy dealership, 15 <laughs> pre-orders. Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's where they had to cap it, because they don't have a lot me yet. Like, they're, they want to ha- make sure everyone who pre-orders get, can get it when the first shipments come out. So, right. And that's this year, compared to the Model 3, which is potentially two and a half years from now for me. Wow, this year. Can we go for a test ride? 
I'm just I probably won't get a test ride. Like <laughs> I'll no, probably no, get, get my no, car when, when you talking, get your, when your car. Of course, your absolutely. Car, can no, we I, go for a absolutely. test ride? We'll hit that zero to sixty in like sub whatever milliseconds. Uh, milliseconds. <laughs> that would be too fast. That You'd probably be, squish yourself. Instant yeah, that'd be torque. too fast. Uh, I saw a Chevy Bolt EV. Um, it's labeled out in the back uh, on the road just a couple of days ago, and it was a uh, self-driving. Chevy Bolt. Now there were drivers in there. I think they yeah. were doing some testing, but in San Francisco, uh, is it Lyft? I heard they have. Well, GM is partnered has owns Lyft, right? Or they have a stake in Lyft. So yeah, they've partnered with them, and I th- understand they have about a dozen Chevy EVs doing self driving tests around. Yeah, it's the Bolt. Bay Area. It had two lidar um, sensors on the top spinning away. Uh, the car did not look that spectacular. No, I mean, compared to... If that's not why you buy this car. No, I don't, of course not. You buy it because it has the exact same range as the Tesla Model 3, and it's coming out this year. Mm. And it's the same price. And it's the same price. Yeah. And and if you want a more tactile dashboard, yeah. you don't want a touchscreen, then you're also going to get so that as well. So if you get this, are you going to uh, have three cars? You have two cars right no, now? No, no, no. I'm going to trade in my, my 10-year-old Mazda. Oh, okay. So you're going to go down to two... Like, this will be your primary commute vehicle, and then... Yeah, the other car will be long range. 238 miles is not bad. Yeah. Plus, you know, it'll have the DC fast charger on it and potentially do a trip. You just got to plan ahead. Uh, th- I mean, that's a whole world I, I don't understand yet, but it, it'll be fun to experiment with. And I'm just really excited about never going to a gas station again. Uh, last thing on this. Uh, do you know how much it is to get the fast charging installed in your home? Well, like, you can't do DC fast charging in your home. Oh, okay. Because that's, that's 480 volts. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's not... Possible. Yeah, but that so everyone's doing 240 at home. Okay, and you have to pay something to get something installed in your home. Yeah, you just need a 240 volt outlet. So if you don't have that yet, yeah, you should probably have an electrician run that. But a lot of people do it themselves if they're crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just you get a what they call a charger and put it on the wall, but it's actually not a charger. It's just like it. It's more of a a, a relay, as I understand it. Or does it is it a does it convert AC to DC? In any case, the charger's in the car, and you get that thing to plug into the car. All right. Okay. So as of today, also for people who already have an EV and maybe even self-driving EV, but I mean Tesla, uh, you're going to get your uh, version 8 autopilot so- uh, software updated over the air tonight as announced by Elon Musk over Twitter. Well, yesterday, if it's Thursday. I guess, yeah. Yesterday, you may should already have it. Model S owners and Model X owners who have that feature. It's a major overhaul. Uh, this is, of course, a uh, software update in response to some of the recent accidents that have happened because of the uh, with the, those uh, Model Xs and Model Ss in autopilot. It's it's part of their beta software. So uh, it, I think redistributes how how important the different sensors are to autopilot, radar oh. versus the, um, the camera. And so radar is now more important um, and the, the camera is less important because that's the one that can get tricked more by computer vision. Yeah, so they're saying that, you know, they don't. They can't say anything with absolute certainty, but they do think that this would have avoided the accident that Josh Brown had earlier this year, where he was killed while using autopilot, and apparently never didn't break, so he wasn't watching the road ahead, and he ran into a truck. Um, so yeah, they're, they're and they've gone back to. I think they're working with the manufacturer of the radar system, and they have finessed and tweaked the system so that it's now more weighted towards that. It's doing more interesting analytics where it bounces signals under cars in front of it and such. Did you see that comma.ai announcement that their kit's going to come out at the end of the year? Turn your Oh, is that the augmented thing where you can take a car and make it self or uh, Yes. Um, I chatted with the guy. Um, it's uh, George Hot- Hutz. Um, is this when you went to the autonomous race day? You, yeah. You chatted with them? He was there. They had a car there. Um, but basically, he's going to sell a kit that... For a thousand dollars, will let you turn certain cars. I already have the existing sensors, so the car needs to have the basically um, uh, the adaptive cruise control mm-hmm. functionality. But you put a camera on the car, and it's trained with their app that they had released. Uh, then you can basically give it autonomous driving for a thousand bucks. Yeah. All right. It's got, I mean, that's got to be so tricky with so many cars out there, different models. Different, it is. And so th- I think software. they're going to like rate certain cars you know, um, yeah. to be to more suitable for these. I believe I think Nissan Altimas are the ones that um, are the most compatible. So they're going to do a beta program. But 
uh, it's basically mounting a phone, mounting a camera uh, where your rear view mirror would be and having that be um, the, the camera system for the front. Yeah. So it's not about cameras all around the car. It's about maintaining distance, seeing the road, and, and then using the, the existing sensors on the car for proximity. It's cool. But what about uh, the adaptive cruise? Because that, that doesn't steer, does it? So, th- yeah, that's a good question. So I think this, then you need to have the system be of a car where you can tie into the steering and then, yeah. and, and do be speed-controlled steering. Mm. Yeah. Um, other futuristic products, uh, projects. AT&T, this, uh, this week, announced AT&T Labs is doing a, a gigabit Wi-Fi project. Um, and it's called AirGig. Um, it's an infrastructure project that's going to piggyback on existing power cables. Um, and Google apparently and Facebook have already been experimenting in that space, but uh, it's uh, it's something that's they you know AT and T has a long history of you know of experimentation, research, and new technologies, and uh, they're doing trials for this. So there's a video on YouTube, Project AirGig. Uh, they haven't said uh, their first field trials are next year, but no idea of when this is actually going to make it over to their network. It feels like a lot of things are getting called gigabit that aren't really the gigabit in the way that we understand them to be. How could that be? What do you mean? Well, because I, I think when people think about gigabit, that it's reliably mm-hmm. over that speed. And I think some of these things are peak speeds mm. and not under load from multiple users. We typically... That's typically how they treat wireless speeds is that they're, you know, peak and that the real world usage is typically like half of that. Whereas the hard, the hard, you know, Ethernet gigabit is actually consistent. Yeah. And when it comes to like this power line system, um, there's very little room for redundancy, as I understand it. So if the signal goes down, like you're just boned um, uh, on these systems as it stands now. That's why it's like a research project in a way. But. I mean, I th- that is what makes me um, w- very skeptical about some of these systems right now. Yeah, everyone wants to look for what what does five G look like, right? When the post four G world and is it bandwidth that they want? Is it reliability? I mean, is my it, shoes need coverage? internet. Yeah, yeah. How else will we know how to loosen and tighten our laces to synchronize our our lace tightness? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I walk home, I want my shoes to automatically unlace. Mm, yeah, I dig it. Right, right. So you're one. It's like Iron Man. Iron Man had basically self-lacing shoes. When I when Tony Stark landed on the Avengers Tower in Avengers, his his iron boot completely unlaced and he just walked off. Is mm. that the dream? Yeah, obviously. And then, and then also onto a charging port, presumably. Oh, I assume yeah. it was getting charged below yes. the surface. Yeah. You know, they got the voice all wrong. Remember that jacket that self-dried in Back to the Future? It, oh, that's like, the one. Your jacket is dry. It was like total Steve Hawking, and that they got completely wrong because now voices are almost indistinguishable from human speech. Almost. Yeah, almost. Almost. They just paid, paid a, a voice actor or actress to repeat a, thousands of lines and stitch them together. Um, Photokina. That's the big camera event happening this week. And I think a lot of the technology news out this week is out of from Vodokina. So let's go through some of the highlights. GoPro has finally unveiled their Karma drone. This is something that's been rumored for so long. And um, and they've released videos from it. And people are very skeptical about what, what's going to make this different than uh, other consumer drones. We've just embraced drone now. Is that what we're doing? Quadcopters, I think we have to. We used to fight that fight. Three syllables, three <laughs> syllables versus the one. All right. Yeah, I think they're interchangeable. Drone it is. Let's call it a drone. They're, they they do have automatic flying capabilities. They're not just RC. Okay. Yeah, RC quadcopters, I think, yeah. Uh, we'll go between them both. But the point is taken. So um, Karma, Karma Drone is their small, compact drone system that obviously is made to use with GoPros, both the GoPro Hero, the new GoPro Heroes 4 and 5, and also the GoPro Heroes, the Sessions. Uh, but it has the one feature that's unique to it is that the three-axis stabilizing gimbal can then be detached from the quad and put on a mountable handle 
and be used as something like a stabilized camera systems like the Osmo or the the Feiyu Tech for the, the that were the previously third party uh, stabilized camera systems. Well, the Inspire One camera had this kind of attachment, didn't it? Well, the Inspire One lets you replace the camera, their X3 camera, with another camera. No, what did you but walk the, the Osmo. So, yeah, that, that but that was a, sold as a one package. Oh, I see. So you never were able to buy initially the Inspire and then just the handle. Okay. And and you had to buy those things separately for the Osmo as a, as a system. Here, within one package, you get the drone and you get the handle that you get to take off the gimbal. Oh, and the whole gimbal detaches. The whole so gimbal it reuses detaches. that whole thing. That's yes. cool. Okay. Uh, and then you plug into a handle that makes it handheld, or you can then mount it onto other things. Uh, it holds a GoPro. There are SKUs that you can have with the GoPro or without the GoPro. It's $800 if you already have your own GoPro, and I think it goes up to $1,100 if you wanted to include the Hero 4 uh, or Hero 5. I, I think it's Hero 5. Has there been any sort of reviews yet of how well it flies? Yeah, so no. <laughs> uh, there are only the, the videos, and people are now sharing them. Um, and the, the I don't think they flew it at their announcement even. Uh, what we want to avoid is a scenario where we had like really poor flight like bugs, um, like when 3DR uh, first released a solo. That didn't perform nearly as well. But so... It has a controller with a built-in touchscreen. You don't need to plug in your own phone to it. Um, and uh, they talked about battery life being in the 20s of minutes uh, for an hour of typical. charge. Yeah, very typical for that kind of um, lithium-ion battery. Uh, we don't know how powerful those motors are, so whether this is going to be for flying in a you know within 500 feet of you or is this going to be for flying within uh, miles of you and how it perfor performs in high altitude. Um, but it's going to come out end of October, October 23rd. So it's still a little ways away. Um, and at those prices, um, it's, you know, it's competitive. They're saying dollars. the stats say maximum distance of only, um, a thousand meters, a thousand meters. That's less than a mile. That's a half mile. Yeah. Half mile, uh, maximum speed, uh, about 35 miles per hour, which is, that's, that's a, fine. A, that's fine. It's about the, the speed of, uh, the Phantom 4 in, in, in sport mode. You know, that's 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 pretty fast, but it's reliability, like how well it it works on the GPS and Wi-Fi signals. I mean, and just how smooth it is uh, to fly. Like those are all big questions. And if if you own a GoPro, you know, it makes that's kind of interesting. And that grip handle, I think, is really compelling. Yeah, yeah, because those third-party gimbal accessories for GoPros are already in the two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollar range. So if you're looking for that and you have a, a GoPro you like. Uh, then this might be a great way yeah. to adopt a new quadcopter and start flying. So you mentioned that this comes with the Hero 4. You can bundle it. But didn't they announce the new Hero as well? Yeah, actually, I'm not sure if it's the Hero 4 or the 5 that's, that's in the high-end bundle. But they did. Yes, that's the other thing that they announced. It's the GoPro Hero 5. It's been almost two years since wow. the, the Hero 4 has been announced. Uh, and... GoPro has, you know, they have had sluggish sales. I don't think anyone's, uh, their stock's gone down. Uh, I think they saturated the market with the cameras. And there are a lot of nice third-party alternatives to GoPros that are lower cost using similar sensors from China. So the Hero 5, what they did was, you know, 6 to 4K. Um, that now has, it's completely waterproof without a case, which is a big deal. Oh, that's kind of cool. And it has a touchscreen built in in the back. And the high-end one is four hundred dollars as opposed to five hundred dollars. So, did they just uh, did they release both the um, uh, the main hero or whatever it's called, like Hero was Black or something? Did they release a small version, the Sessions? Too? Yeah. So instead of having like the GoPro Hero Silver, regular, and then Black and Plus Edition or whatever it's called, there it's just the Hero Five Black and the Hero Five Session. And the Session is their more portable cube-like camera um, and a little bit cheaper. Uh, you don't get uh, GPS. You don't get display. You don't get raw photo support, uh, but it's $300 as opposed to $400. I say it has one button simplicity and voice control. And Wi-Fi that you can use Wi-Fi to... Uh, it's to tiny. That's neat, though. Yeah. So the one thing I've always wanted in a GoPro, and maybe the, the gimbal mount makes it you know, uh, not worth it is I would I always wanted some stabilization in it um in the in the shot and you mean like a optical in yeah it? Um, and I think right now they just do electronic is yeah, that do you think there's 
value in optical stabilization inside GoPros given that they're action cameras, or are they just going to transfer that all into the gimbals? I think the gimbal takes care of, mo- takes care of mo- most of it. Uh, lens system, I think that would make it a little more, way more expensive for, to have that size sensor and that size lens with OIS for video. I think their, a- their wide angle is so wide, and it, with 4K footage, you have resolution to spare to do the digital stabilization. Mm. I think that's yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and they also launched a new subscription service that um, gives you discounts on accessories and also lets you plug uh, automatically upload your footage to their web server for editing and for sharing. Mm. Oh. What else came out of Photokina? Uh, so that's the action camera stuff. I thought the, the Karma drone is finally the big announcement and it answers the question of, of how they got away with showing those promo videos shot with the the drone, but like in very enclosed spaces because it was also being handheld. Um, camera stuff, uh, the big camera announcement was from Fujifilm. Uh, they have a camera called the GFX 50S, and it's a medium format camera, uh, larger than full frame. Pentax has had medium format digital cameras, so it's Hasselblad, but Fujifilm moving into the space, it's a big deal. And so uh, when we say medium format, we mean the sensor size is uh, almost two times, 1.7 times larger than your typical 35 millimeter frame. And even the full frame cameras now are much bigger than your APS cameras, which is uh, the more common DSLRs. And those are bigger than, of course, your one inch size ones. And those are bigger than your GoPro and your smartphones ones. So this is a professional ass professional camera. Um, but they're going to have a whole lens ecosystem for this, um, and they're they're making um, a, a 120 millimeter lenses, 64 millimeter lenses, and a 63 millimeter lens, um, all f- f4s or f2.8s, uh, with down the roadmap later on more lenses. So they're, they're investing in it. Um, they want people. To, they're great for you know. At, with this big of a sensor, you're going to get amazing portraits. Wow, the camera's not that much bigger either. It's, that's that's the, the big thing, right? They're, it's under the mirrorless ca- category. Uh, so it's such a, such a it's a digital screen, and they're taking advantage of the fact that image processing technology, you can get them small in chips, and what's really taking up the size of this is battery and sensor, and then your lens. You're going to be able to do some amazing low-light stuff with this camera. Amazing low-light stuff. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's nine thousand dollars. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. Or I, I, actually, it's sorry. The Hasselblad one is nine thousand dollars. This will be. Uh, they don't know the price, but people are hoping that it will cost under five thousand. <laughs> the Hasselblad <laughs> one, the Pentax ones, are all are both above uh, above five thousand. That's more than uh, my car is worth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is. It's it's a high end photographer's tool. Yep. But it goes you know, with the trend of putting big sensors and high-quality sensors into smaller bodies, which Sony did with you know, their, um, their A7 and, the, um, and their, their fixed lens one. Um, speaking of Sony, Sony has a new camera as well. Uh, they didn't announce the A9, which people were, was, they were rumored to do, which would be like a high-end sports camera, um, or the A7R3. But their A mount lenses, which I guess technically are their flagship, these SLT lenses, uh, SLT cameras, uh, has a new one. It's the Sony A992, Mark II. Um, and it's a, this is a DSLR, so it's not a mirrorless camera. Um, it's technically not a DSLR because it's SLT, but it's a DSLR form factor. Um, so you have a translucent uh, mirror system that you can see and get an optical viewfinder, but then you can also, um, it, it doesn't flip up, is, is Sony's technology. Um, it'll do 4K video. It has their five axis steady shot, which is something that's been great for Sony. So this is actual physical stabilization. They did that in the A7. The sensor. Yeah, they have, they've had the it in the one. A7 line, um, which makes it great for video. It's 42 megapixels with a ton of autofocus points. Um, and it shows that they're not giving up on this A line. Now, why would you get this instead of the A7, the, the like the high res A7 that does the uh, comparable? Because you have the SLT viewfinder technology. Why would you want that? Because it, I, light is faster than electronic signals. Hmm. <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, and Sony also has a whole suite of A mount lenses that they want to continue supporting. So people who invested have invested in A mount lenses. Hmm. 
they i mean this is also for them um let's see uh I'll do 4K video, it has headphone jacks. The price is $3,200, uh, and it's available on sale yesterday, or right. pre-sale yesterday. All right. Is there any other cameras that came out of Photokina that I can't afford? <laughs> <laughs> um, Canon had their new mirrorless camera, the M5. Uh, this one adopts um, some of the autofocus technology, the, the dual pixel autofocus technology from the 5D Mark IV. Um, which did we talk about the 5D Mark IV a little bit on the podcast Don't last week? Don't think so. Yeah. No. So this is the big. Uh, it was the one that photographers, Canon photographers, been waiting for for a long time, and they did something unique um, with their sensor with dual pixel autofocus, which apparently allows you to do real time face tracking autofocus when you're shooting video. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to test this. Imagine shooting video. You're holding the camera. You have the viewfinder. Uh, the LCD screen that you're seeing the video and they do face recognition. You can tap the faces and it will do rack focus between the faces and it'll track the faces apparently fast enough that if you walk toward me, if you're on a bicycle, uh, it will still keep you in focus as you are, as you're moving th- through laterally in the frame. Okay. Which would be great for shooting video. You don't need to move the lens. Yeah. Uh, they can do this because of the dual pixel autofocus, but what they can also do is then take um, like within every pixel, they they take a left and a right image for every pixel. Yeah. What? What does that uh, mean? So, let's say on a sensor, um, let's say a, a forty megapixel sensor is how many pixels vertically? You have like it's an array of pixels, right? Mm-hmm. Each of the pixels actually has subpixel arrays that lets you take a left image, a left part of image, and a right part of image. And what you can do, and they use it for autofocus, but you, what you can do is you can save all that data into a special format with the Canon cameras, and then using their software, change your depth of field slightly. What? Very, or your change of fo- your plane of focus very slightly. What do you mean? There's some, there's some kind of stereo understanding of the space? Um, not of the space, because it's so, let me see if I can be- best explain it with, a, with an image. Um, this, this is futuristic. I don't understand this. You're not talking about two complete images. You're not talking about I get a left and a right image that I can see in 3D. You technically get a left and a right image, but they were so close together. <laughs> as if your eyes were really like right as, next as, to each as other? As if you were an insect. Right. Um, that it's used for autofocus because yeah. uh, that gives you a better s- sense of the scene. Uh-huh. But what you can do for a photo is you can slide back like a millimeter forward and back. Which might be focus. just enough to get that eye in focus or something like That's that. That's what the reviewers have been trying to, to see if it's, if it's actually useful. That's wild. But it saves, a t- it, it's like double your picture data because you because the, the file is... Oh, it's a new fo- file format? It's, an, it's, a, it's a new file. Um, and right now you can only make those micro adjustments yeah. using Canon software. Oh. It's not in Lightroom or Photoshop just yet. Okay. Uh, and it's also apparently computationally intensive. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's two photodiodes for every pixel site. So, hey, just on that subject of depth and eye, how close are your eyeballs, do insects have less depth perception than humans? It depends on the insect. Okay, well, let's say not a fly because they see a million things. What about a, like a grasshopper or something that can see, maybe that sees forward, but its eyes are so close together? Oh, I don't know. That's you know what I mean? Point. Yeah, I do know what you mean. Does that become more or less monoscopic? Okay. No idea. All right. That's it. That's uh, that's my little tangent. All right. Uh, one last thing from Photokina. People also got some hands-on with a new Leica camera, but uh, it's actually a Leica Polaroid camera. Are Polaroids back? I think they are. I think analog. <laughs> you were using one the other day. We were at a, an event. and Yeah. You bust out one that I, you must have gotten at your wedding or I something. I b- bought it for the wedding so people take Polaroids. Uh, it was a, the, um, I want to say a Fujifilm. Yeah, the Instamax Mini 90. It's like a hundred something dollars. The film is, you know, they're about a dollar a shot or something. So it's not cheap. Uh, but but it's, it's actually the old style? Actual huh. small little Polaroids. Oh. Uh, it's, it's fun to use. And Leica has their own one and they're selling their own Polaroid stock. Do they don't call it Polaroid, though, do they? 
Uh, I think they huh. they do. Okay. Uh, the camera's called the Sofort, and um, you know, I think they're trying to bring it back. The kids are tired of doing their oh, Instagrams. Cool. They want to take their Leica Polaroids. I mean, I'm surprised they're not printers at this point. So well, I you been, want the chemical reaction. Oh yeah, I know you like that. I, yeah. That's cool. So I've been waiting to ask this question because I was I was telling Jeremy before the podcast, I'm going to India later this year on a trip with my family. And I've never had a DSLR in my life or any sort of high end um uh, camera. Seeing all these new announcements, where should I go, Norm? What should I what would you get for How much you want to invest? An in, epic in, trip. Sub 1000, I would sub say. Sub 1000 and you want something that's pocketable that or you want like a thing with a big lens. I want something where if I um, break it or scratch it or it gets stolen, I'm not going to, you know, curl up in a ball for three months. Uh, I would get a Sony RX100. I said the A6000. The, both of those are great. Why would you get that? Um, the A6000 or A6300, but the 6000 is the last gen one, which you can get mm-hmm. for like 500 bucks now. Uh, APS size sensor. It works with a bunch of Sony lenses. You can get a nice compact prime one, um, and you're gonna get some really great photos. Shoot them in RAW. Have fun afterward editing them. Um, really enjoyable. Uh, the Sony RX100, which I believe is currently in the Mark IV, um, is closer to a thousand dollars. Actually, I think it is a thousand dollars. It's a one-inch size sensor, so technically a smaller sensor, but um, more versatile because it's the size of a point and shoot. So it's probably mm. in that category, the point and shoot pocketable, you know, put it in your jacket pocket. Uh, you're going to get much, much better photos than your phone. So it depends like how much, you know, how your travel goes. Are you going to be in places where you're carrying a backpack more often or a place where you're going to have just jackets or not even jackets? There you go. Thank you. You're probably just going to end up with your phone. <laughs> No, I might get. I don't know. I'll probably end up with my phone. Invest in a camera. It, it, you'll have fun learning it. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, back from Fudokino. Let's go. Let's, let's let's bounce back up. Let's bounce back up out of out of the camera world. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're back to our old podcast ways. I I think muting is more harm than good. Oh, yeah? I try to keep it, you know, so I don't get any false po- like sounds. Yeah, and then I just screw it up. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm about to tell you something else that totally went wrong during this podcast. As you go into the <laughs> Google Allo uh, part, so we're going to talk about uh, this new messaging app, Google Allo. Hello. Oh. And uh, so I installed it at the very beginning of this podcast as yeah. the theme was going on, and I was like, oh, it was released last night. I was going to try it out. I've messaged people. It has been a dumpster trash fire on my phone. Wait, can you only message other people with Allo? Uh, I mean, it's design. The features are really designed for people that have it installed, but you can do SMS out of it and okay. stuff too. Um, but my phone has crashed twice now with this app <laughs> installed. The reviews have been utterly terrible. I mean, one of the of appeals of it was that it was end-to-end encryption. It wouldn't store any messages anywhere. Which they backed off of already. Yeah, it, Be- incognito is not the default mode. Yeah, so you have to select into an encrypted mode, uh, which kind of stinks. Uh, and then uh, it has an assistant as part of this app. And the assistant is sort of relentlessly annoying at this point. Um, so it, I've only used it for, what, like an hour at this point? And I have not enjoyed my experience. I have not gotten a message back within it properly in a way that is normal in a notification on my phone way. So I, I don't know what to think of this yet. Think of how, uh, can you explain how the bot works, how this d- assistant works? Uh, I'm gonna bring it up so Jeremy can see, but basically it's sending me little messages as I try to message people. Like, mm. do you want to do this? I may use your device location to help you uh, say cert- uh, send certain messages. It seems like it was an integration try with like Google Now mm-hmm. in some way, that assistant. But I don't need help messaging people. Like, how much help do you need inside of that world? Mm, this sounds like Clippy. So it's the idea of like, if you ask, it's context aware. So based on what most people have conversations about, you know, about finding food, restaurants, movies. Yeah. Uh, it takes those keywords, which of course then Google's tracking. And then also then presents options to theoretically uh, 
expedite the communication process. So the real world example of this, New York Times did a review where they tested this out, where if you if I send a message to my wife saying with the keyword movie in it, the assistant will try to pick that out and be like, hey, do you want to know some show times for movies tonight? And but it's not context aware enough to actually really be useful to know when to back off. Yeah. Uh, at this point. Uh, and that idea of like, I need help with movie times and stuff is so low bar. I think if I was traveling, this might actually work really well. It might like pop up my boarding pass electronically really quickly, but Google's done that in other forms. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like that's a great addition. Yeah. It's really the encryption thing bothers me a lot that, that it, you have to opt in. That Why? was the thing they, they sold it on. But yeah, that's what most people don't care about that. Uh, I think it, I, I think with what's happened in the last year with Apple and the FBI, yeah. that encryption on messages should just become a standard practice for these two companies. All right. Uh, well, you know, Google may have dropped the ball on this app. And um, hopefully it will get better. Uh, it's Android only. If, uh, is that correct? Yep. Uh, well, something else that's coming up in the Android world is possibly a new phone. Not a Nexus phone, but the Google Pixel I'm phone. excited about this. So invites have been sent for an October 4th announcement, which w apparently will be live stream. So we'll be following that. Not going, unfortunately. Um, for a new phone, the expectation is two phones, a Pixel and a Pixel XL. Uh, hardware made by Google. Well, HTC still is the manufacturer of the phone. Mm, designed but, by Google. Yeah, it seems like Google had a much stronger hand in the design and internals of this compared to other previous <laughs> flagship phones. Uh, there's pictures that have already been leaked of the phones. It's shown up in a Nest ad. It has a very iPhone-esque look. iPhone 6-esque. Yeah, well, they all do. Yeah, so it's like... Um, I don't have a picture up on my screen. I'll, I'll bring one up for Jeremy. But... Uh, I would. It still has a fingerprint sensor on the back, like my Nexus 6P does, um, but it just kind of has a cleaner look. So here's where it kind of starts to get interesting. Uh, that's a departure for Google, is that it supposedly is not going to come with uh, Android 7 Nougat stock. It's going to come up with a beefed up version. So they're trying to create some separation between their flagship phone and all the other Android devices on the market. That's a, sorry, I keep bumping that. Um, that's a totally different direction uh, for Google. How do I don't you feel know about that? that? Means. I mean, uh, I feel like one of the criticisms of Android is the fragmentation. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. It depends on what a beefed up nougat means in terms of uh, real world like features. If encryption is better on this phone, I'm totally there with you. If, uh, if like, more assistant features and it's just more obtrusive, I'm not there uh, at all. There's um, – and the design aesthetics, I don't think that means a whole lot to me. Like, if you're, if you're into the design of your phone, the look and feel, the finish, the material science of your phone, why do you have an Android phone? Like, that's iPhone's whole business model in a lot of ways. So – I I'm um I feel like iPhone had that advantage and everyone else is more or less caught up. Yeah, this is true. Uh, but I would say I'm um here's what I'm really look I the things I'm looking for is the camera specs. Yep. Let let's see what the camera is. It's not going to be dual lens. I think we already know that, but I mean uh just what is it going to look like? And then just some basic features that we've seen come out on every other phone like what's the display? Is it going to be like brighter, more effective, waterproof? Are they going to go that direction? I don't know. Battery, super critical to me. Um, and just some, ba like, that headphone jack better be in there. <laughs> There's no rumors it's not going to be there. Uh, I would love, even though I've converted to USB-C, I would like to see a return to wireless charging, which was in some of their older phones. Hmm. I didn't realize that was taken out. That's a feature in the Bolt that you can get. There's a wireless charging in the like the little charging station next to your. Oh, arm. it has one in the yeah built into in the, the car. center. Anything you're hoping for out of this phone, Norm? Good design. Yeah, I I mean tight integration. A Nexus phones I thought did did a great job with that. So I, I think that going forward, 
if they control the actual physical design of this phone, then what does that mean from a Google perspective? What do, what do they what do they want to represent in the physical world that's going to be representative of their software? What I actually want from this event, because they're probably going to talk about other hardware, I'm hoping they're going to talk about more hardware than just the phones, is that we get our first peek at Google Home. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, okay, uh, speaking of phones again, let's go back to the cameras, but talk about a little bit of the iPhone. Um, reviews are out. Units are shipping. Some people have the pluses. Some people don't yet. Do you have one yet? I do not have one yet. Okay. It's. I think it's uh, on its way, almost here. Um, but the big question is uh, the pluses, which they sold out immediately because uh, rich people were buying eight of them for their dogs. <laughs> that was a uh, little story. Yeah, yeah, a billionaire's son in China bought seven or eight iPhone 7s for his dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, since the phones come out, there have been a lot more testing with the cameras. Something we're still going to do to figure out what if there are any differences between the 28 millimeter lens and sensor and the 56 millimeter they're calling a telephoto lens and sensor. What's interesting to find out is how they're integrating them both right now. They take two shots. We talked about this last week. Choose the best pixels from each. There's a lot of stuff that Phil Schiller kind of talked about, all those billion operations that happen every time you press a button to take the shutter. Um, the question for me, though, is how the portrait mode it's is. It's not available yet. It's not available. People are getting some, started to get some testing. TechCrunch uh, got hands-on no with the portrait mode. and was able to try to decipher how the, the camera systems, uh, the wide angle, how it, how it creates that depth map. Um, and they're saying that it, you know, the phone, Apple's telling them the phone creates a depth map and then slices the scene into nine separate depths mm -hmm. and then blurs between the depths based on where it thinks the subject is. Yep. So the subject's in the front or subject's in the back because you can always do front focus um, or, or back focus where you have a, the subject in the back, uh, and then the front is all blurred out, uh, which is a neat effect. Uh, how how is that calculated, and whether the blur places work? So and where is that seam? And where know? is the seam? Because right. if you take an actual, with if you do that with a proper lens, yeah, there is no seam. Like it's it's a hard edge around what's in focus, and then if it's if the background is far enough away, it's going to be really blurry all of a sudden. But I imagine if they're doing this, there's probably going to be some blending. Yeah, and, and how, how many degrees of blending per each layer. Yeah. Uh, even with a high-end camera, if you're trying to simulate something with a really, really you know, fast lens, wide aperture, or big sensor, uh, you don't actually necessarily get the seam around a silhouette of a person. Because if you're focused on the eyes, for example, yeah. you've got to keep the eyes focused, but you still have some blending between the, the side of the head and the back of the hair and the hairline. You think it's going to be that refined? Like, Because the demos they showed were more of like the whole subject is in focus mm. and the background is blurred out. But if you can do that kind of that granular amount of depth of field where you can really just get the eyes in focus, well, I, I think that'll be impressive. That's easier because then it's tough to clip out just like the hair. But it's a more subtle amount of depth. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it's gonna it's gonna be interesting if the phone can, the software. can I detect mean, that. Yeah, the fact that they couldn't launch it in time for, uh, for the phone's launch, yeah. that that they would actually delay this feature by a few months, that's a big deal. That's an admission that one they started this too late, or two, it's such a complex task for them that they didn't want to rush it. Yeah. which it's like it's concession at some point. Uh, the question I have is whether you can take photos now with the seven plus. And does that data get stored in the photo so that you can apply this as a filter later on and oh. get that software processing? Or yeah, or do you have to do it at photo time? Right, because yeah. they do a real. They say they do a real time rendition of what it will look like, what the blur will look like, and it's what it sounds like is that you're not going to be able to to adjust the blur. It's going to be automatic. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. That would have been fun. It's a straight up depth effect, like that, a Lytro. You'd be able to adjust later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, because it's a feature not coming out now, can you? I mean, ideally, you'd be able to take portraits now or toggle an option to save both images, save as much data as possible, and then apply. I mean, they're technically filters, but computationally intensive filters on these on these later for uh, for to good effect. Something's still super curious about. Um, other things uh, regarding the iPhone, uh, new iPhone uh, DisplayMate did their in-depth review of the new phone um, screen and says it's their best LCD smartphone screen they've ever seen. So good on Apple. The wide gamut actually apparently 
it's, it's proven. Yeah, it's funny though that like the photos look best on your phone, but that's probably not the most. You're not going to share them on your phone. I mean, I guess you could show people, but I mean, I, I, we I, need other displays to catch up. True, and I, I think um, phone screens. I, I don't think that's a, a bad way to think about it because like. A lot of the phones when I was using the Galaxy S6, they looked best on that OLED screen, yeah. the AMOLED screen. And phones are increasingly the places where not only do you take the photos, but you also view the photos. It's where you care about viewing the photos the most. Like, and also, if you take photos with your DSLR and you put them on your phone, you also want your phone to be able to, to, to show them the best. Yeah. It's the screen you're looking at almost the most. Um, the headphone adapter. Yeah, I, there was. I I can't even find the article now, but it was opened up, so mm -hmm. th there is a DAC inside. That was my only question. Mm. It's only nine dollars, but I figured they had to have a DAC in there because they weren't going to dedicate some lightning pins to audio. So um, indeed, it's all crammed in there. It's super small, but there is, a, you know, not an insubstantial amount of electronics inside this very small adapter. And this is the adapter that turns a lightning into a. Uh, three and a half millimeter yeah. or a mil three and a half millimeter into mm -hmm. a lightning? Well, it, it's the thing that you plug your headphones into if you have a analog head headphones. Yeah. Ah, so it's to turn three and a half millimeter into lightning. Yep. It's not so that you can plug the lightning headphones that came with your phone oh, into no. an airplane chair. No, no, no. No, that's the problem. Like, yeah. You, you still need to keep a pair of analog headphones with you. Yeah. Because, sorry, the world still runs analog. Per exactly. All right, uh, a couple other product things. Uh, while I was out, Lenovo, um, uh, I think at Coffee Decks announced their yoga book. Uh, have you guys seen this? Uh, no. Um, I got a little preview of What's it. What's a yoga me. book? Well, the yoga was, is their foldable you know, ta uh, oh, laptop uh, line. Yes, okay. But the, their new product, the yoga book, and you guys should take a look at this picture. Um, they have an Android version and a Windows version. Where's the keyboard? Exactly. <laughs> it's like a it's a notebook, the size of a notebook, huh. uh, with a with a screen. Uh -huh. uh, but instead of having a keyboard, uh, a it physical keyboard, it's a it's a digital it keyboard. It better like emerge from the bottom. Why would I want that? Um, because it also comes with a Wacom pen, and the idea is that you can draw on that surface. Oh, that's cool. And okay. and it becomes a drawing notebook. This is what the courier was supposed to be. But this feels horrible. No one wants to touch non tactile keys. It, that is the biggest hurdle that it has to overcome. They're saying that you know you'll get used in a couple hours, but it's a small book. It's a small notebook. It's it's not as big as like a thirteen inch laptop. Um, it's really light. It's uh, uh, less than a pound and a half, basically. Um, but you can also with that pen, you can put a piece of paper on top of the keyboard section. Yeah. And swap out the stylus nib for a pen nib and draw. Mm -hmm. Like you would a, a on a sheet of paper, and it also gets digitized. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's also five hundred fifty bucks, so it's, oh, it's cheap. That's cheap. Yeah. I mean, I guess it is really small. It's really small. Mm. It's also running off an Atom processor, so oh. hmm. it's it's and it's um, ten inch display, nineteen twenty, twelve hundred. You know, the Stranger Things poster was uh, sketched and drawn on an iPad Pro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's old news, Jeremy. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I just yes. found out. You, you just got to bring it back to Apple. Norm <laughs> this, has internet again. Things are old. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, I, did, I did finally watch the full Apple keynote because I want the, to see the subtle, like there's a lot in, lot in the presentation I think that reveals a lot about um, how they think about their products and the roadmaps. And uh, it was fun to see Mario on stage. That's what I said. I said that to the to the team that week, and I couldn't get any any love for that. That well, that, I just, that was my most exciting. We moment. were less excited about the game. I was less excited about a one tap game. You know, I never Mario. asked you about that. You, you uh, can eat a sandwich or an apple. What? what yeah, that's what he said on stage. You can, that's what Mimoto said. You can eat a sandwich. Oh, play while, while you play. While yes, you play that's right. Are you excited apple. about the game? I'm excited. I'm I'm excited to see what they can bring to that kind of endless runner game. Absolutely, because yeah. they'll do it right. Yeah. You know? I like the idea that parts of it, I mean, it's just the one innovation they showed on stage, the idea that you, it's endless, but the speed is variable. There are parts where it slows down for more challenging parts of the map. I didn't notice that. Yeah, like you're running and running and it slows down. And this part, you have to be more precise about beating a part of the level. Hmm. 
Yeah. Can you add bokeh to that part? No, you can't add bokeh to that part. I can't wait. You I'm can... now. I'm just being a jerk. What's weird is that they put it in the app store already. It's the only game ever to be in the app store that you can just get a notification it's for. A, not even a pre-sale. Yeah. It's just like here's the landing page for it because it came on stage and everyone's going to be excited about it. Uh, it's going to be expensive. I mean, it's, it's going to be priced appropriately. What do you think? Let's say that way. What are you saying? Five bucks? No, ten bucks. Uh, I doubt it. You don't think so? No, I'm saying five bucks. They got. I mean, how insane are they going to go on the in-game transactions? I think no, none. none. And he said that. He said we're going to make a game that once you pay for it, you, your kids can have it. And you don't have to worry about them needing to spend more. I money. think ten bucks. Then I think a, it's going to be steal. I think it'll be twenty. No in-game transactions. That's what I actually think. Not. Oh my god, you guys are way off base. The mobile expectation has been set. Now you're you're right. When, when has Apple ever come in underpriced? Apple or, yeah. or Nintendo? Well, I mean, this is uh, you figure Apple's helping set this price. I wonder, I because you know they were knocking on Nintendo's door for years to get this done. I wonder if Apple offered all of their services. Like, I wonder if they offered to cover the cost of development. Wow, no, you don't think so? No. They would have to get Nintendo on their platform first. They they, they uh, gave them better split. Oh, maybe. I bet. I bet right. concessions were made. Seventy-five, twenty-five. Yeah. 20 bucks. <laughs> it's not a full-fledged Mario game. It's an endless runner. I'll bet you this banana for scale. It'll be 20. Uh, do you think if this if it, com- it becomes successful, yeah. if, 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 if it becomes a successful game, does it change Nintendo's roadmap map and how they think about um, hardware and software? Because oh, they're like already, having to control the whole thing? Yeah. Because yeah. they're working on NX, which we presume will get announced early next year. There have been leaks saying that it's maybe a home console slash handheld hybrid, you know, taking the the uh, the, the Wii U controller and making that the solo yeah. console. You, are you saying are they going to go Sega's route and get out of the hardware game? And or just focus be- less on hardware? Yeah, don't know. Don't know. I mean, it would have to be a, such a massive hit for them to do that, though. It will be. <laughs> a billion iPhones out there, guys. Uh, Not all of them support um, support the App Store. What is new with the Nintendo NX? Uh, nothing new except for the fact that the they're increasing um, rumors and uh, the hints that Nintendo representatives have dropped to indicate that it is going to be a hybrid console and and handheld. Okay. Yeah. Anything else in the world of gaming? I think that's it. Uh, oh, yes, uh, a couple more things. This week, Logitech bought SciTech. You know, SciTech makers of our favorite X52 sure. Pro joystick. Interesting. Uh, Logitech's buying them. Uh, there's buying up companies left and right. So, I mean, uh, hopefully it's to make it's to make, um, to make a more increase their peripheral game and make VR controllers. Um, and uh, one last bit of news, uh, MakerBot also announced a new line of replicators, new 3D printers, the Replicator Plus and the Replicator Mini Plus. 2000 bucks for the new replicator. Yep. So it says it's a lot faster. Yeah. And you can the print bed is, is bigger. So yeah. you can larger make... volume. So I don't know if actually the bed is bigger or it can just go taller. So it's larger oh. volume. Um and it uses their uh, their smart extruder plus print head. I, MakerBot's been in a lot of trouble as a company, so I'm wondering: uh, is this sort of a are we in the last ditch effort kind of phase of the of the replicator? I don't know. I, I think they were only in trouble in the sense that the expectations were set too high, and then they mo- made too many products too quickly. They had some internal, um, you know, leadership they built changes. that expensive manufacturing facility yeah. in Brooklyn that yeah. didn't work out. And there's yeah. so many competitors now, and so many good competitors. Yeah, it's tough to compete. It look, one interesting feature of this new printer is the build plate. It's removable and flexible, so that you can pop your print off. That is actually really intriguing because that's one of the hardest parts of printing big objects is getting it off there without breaking it yeah blue tape only goes so far right exactly well yeah it can become too sticky yeah um norman yes uh that's it for technology news but before we move on to the next segment i do want to thank the sponsor other sponsor of this week's podcast and that's squarespace uh this only test is brought to you by squarespace whether you need a landing page 
a beautiful gallery, a professional blog, or an online store, or even a landing site for your wedding, it's all included with your Squarespace website. Um, it's really easy to build a website with their templates. You can just drag and click and arrange content and, and put in galleries, put in all these different widgets. They have free customer uh, domains. Um, so you can just add a domain very simply uh, to your site, sign up for a year, and you get a custom domain for free. Uh, seamless commerce tools if you want to use it as a storefront and great customer support 24-7 um, if you need any technical help. Um, so you can start your free trial today. Just go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TEST, there's four characters, T-E-S-T, -E and that will get you 10% off your first purchase. Uh, that supports them, supports us, and keeps this podcast going. So uh, try out Squarespace. Set your website apart. it's time for a moment of science let's rewind the clock let's go all the way back to 65 bc mm. and we're going to take a trip to greek island and off the coast of this greek island there's a famous wreck it's the antikythera shipwreck and marine... that sounds like something out of a dc comics like some some plot device oh just wait it's getting more fantasy uh marine archaeologists which I, I need that title now. Like the Indiana Jones of the sea. I want that. I want or that Or Laura Croft of the sea. Sure. Still rather have the tenure position that Indiana Jones has. Um, and I don't want to be a tomb raider. I want to be like a, you know, somebody that frees the get, tomb. Get back to Atlanta. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Right, so, right. yeah, anyways. Marine archaeologists uh, discovered a human skeleton amongst the shipwreck. A 2,000-year-old human skeleton that those are it's preserved in salt water it's it it sort of was buried amidst like pottery and some other items from the shipwreck so preserved is a strong word but they w did find skull that had teeth uh, a jawline legs ribs uh, even some arm bones and they're going to start a process now where they're going to try to extract some of the dna some DNA from it. Now, this DNA is most likely degraded significantly, so they're just looking for specific bits. Uh, what is amazing, though, which goes back to your question, is um, this shipwreck is only at the depth of about um, 50 meters or about a couple hundred feet. Mm -hmm. I'll say that it's new where this was then, no? This shipwreck had been known for a number of years, uh, but this discovery of a human skeleton within it is pretty fascinating. With DNA. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With, and maybe. Maybe. No, it's cool. You just fill in the gaps with frog DNA. But did you explain why the antikythera device is interesting? Oh, because the mechanism? The mechanism. Yeah, you can This is the sci-fi aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just the name, antikythera. So in the shipwreck they discovered, well, how many years ago was it? That It was like a couple hundred, 200 years ago? That they found the they shipwreck? They found the, the, it, the it mechanism? It is hundred some years ago, I think. I'll look up that number. You guys follow along. Google anti. Kythera, that's A N T I K Y T H E R A mechanism, um, and it's an ancient analog computer that we think Get out. is mm -hmm. an Ori. An Ori? Yeah. What's an Ori? It, 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 it calculates the um, the orbits of of planet celestial systems. Would they have thought that they were gods or no? Well. No. The, yeah. the short answer is no. They could have used this to um, just track time and various things or yeah. or different um, patterns in um, – uh, there is even some indication that this could have been aboard a bunch of different ships to help them navigate. Um, so that is very unknown. Yeah. So based on – it wasn't so super natural what it, they were looking at. It's based on um, their analysis of it. They think it was made – around 50 to 100 BC. And it is n considered the first known analog computer. And have we recreated it? People have recreated we it. We know how it works. You can 3D print the mechanisms. They've scanned all the parts, and it's, the complexity is incredible for its time. Uh -huh. um, 
but there's so much still mystery surrounding uh, how they could have made something this precise and this complex with those tools at that time. Is it kind of, it's a celestial clock? Basically. It moves, you can tell where the planets are going to be at any certain time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And this is the only example that we that we know of it. It was on this ship. Uh, oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I think I think it is. Yeah. Uh, still, it, it's a. I, I think that MacGyver movie was based off of the Antikythera. What MacGyver movie? You know the one with John Reese Davies. Oh, I know. Ne- there was a MacGyver movie. I don't think I ever knew. What are you this. talking about? Maybe it was TV. Um, maybe it was a. a a TV movie. All right, I gotta I gotta zoom out of this to a to another story. We'll we'll put links to more about the Antikytheria mechanism uh, in the show notes. Uh, let's talk about something that's even stranger. Oh, good. My favorite um, species out there or animal out there, the tardigrade, the good old water bear. You're so excited about this. Jeremy picked off this story this week. Well, they're the the most interesting thing living creature ever. To yeah, be, like they already were. And, and to be fair, tardigrades, which are water bears, uh, there's roughly 140 species of it. So there's a lot of different types of tardigrades. But why they're so interesting is because they can survive long periods of time in deep freeze or ex- other extreme conditions. Tardigrades can essentially be put into space and survive. They have been. Mm-hmm. And so potentially, like you could imagine these even entering our atmosphere, maybe even seeding life on a planet. Yes, that's a it's a stretch the last part of that, but it could be true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, there's a new study published in Nature this week that talked about how in these extreme conditions, the genome of the tardigrade goes under changes. And some of these changes are uh, damaging, like you get solar radiation, just, you know, leaving uh, uh, different sort of mutations and fragments, of the DNA. Uh, but some are positive that lead to adaptations like their ability to withstand long periods of dehydration. Hmm. And these uh, components, which, you know, everything from like withstanding X-ray radiation to uh, developing like uh, a resistance to hydrogen peroxide, which is just amazing uh, unto itself. uh, They took some of these um, uh, pieces of the genome and, and put it into a human kidney cell line to see if they could actually translate some of that resistance over, and it did work. This is comic book stuff. Yeah. It basically, this tardigrade developed superpowers by being put into the most extreme conditions possible. And now we can adopt them. Yes. Again, very, like, I'm going to be a responsible science communicator and say, like, we're not close to adopting it. We're barely at the beginning of it. Now that that's said, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. We can, like, this is uh, pretty amazing because of, these adaptations were never thought possible in terms of how extreme they are, especially the dehydration one. That's the one that's confounded scientists these, for a long Do you mean these adaptations time. even in the water bears? Yeah, because they can basically survive without water for yeah. 30 years. If you freeze them, they can live for 30 years totally frozen. Yeah, they're super beings. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, well, I can get into more. There's more technical details about this, about how the tardigrades potentially... Uh, go through um, uh, horizontal gene transfer to actually uh, switch their genome with other species. Um, But there's been some disputes about what the percentage of that is. Um, But it's like roughly people think it's like in a two to three percent realm. If horizontal gene transfer is actually probably possible, it opens up this idea um, more regularly of bringing some of those uh, genome traits into other species. Transhuman movement rejoice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's cool, right? My silly study of the week that I think is, is kind of fun is a is a a group uh, studied a series of sad movies out of the um, University of Oxford mm. in, in the United Kingdom, and they particularly took a number of of respondents. I think it was sixty eight people, and showed them um, this really sad TV film called Stuart: A Life Backwards, which is about a a disabled homeless man that goes through all these trials and tribulations. And they showed a second group of people, uh, a similar uh, or a different set of films, like just documentaries that had sort of no emotional attachment. 
And what they found is the people that saw the really sad movies were able to withstand something called the Roman chair test, which is a, a test that uh, tests your pain tolerance for a much longer period of time than those that were in the control, indicating that strong emotions give you a little bit of extra strength. Then they also saw the people that went through this together had increased social bonds after seeing a sad movie. Mm. Sad movies make you stronger. Wolverine loves Nicholas Sparks. <laughs> Louis C.K. does a great bit on sadness and how we all have this internal hole that we are trying to avoid with our phones, always trying to connect with people when we start to feel this coming on, this loneliness, this reality that we are going to die alone and may be alone. And... Uh, and he says, you know, one time he just let himself feel that. He pulled over to the side of the road and just let it take him over, and he started to cry and weep, and it was profoundly meaningful to him. And I could see that, you know, we may need to experience that more. You think Louis C.K. would be open to going to work at the University of Oxford? <laughs> <laughs> there might be some How did they choose it. the movie? Uh, oh, I don't know. Right? That, that's why a good is question. this the sad movie? Well, because there was a previous study done on Titanic. Yeah, why not Up, right? Oh, God. You're Just right. watch 10 yeah. minutes of this. That's right. That would be so much more efficient. All you need is a 10 minute, <laughs> yeah. ten minutes of a movie. You can run through so many more trials. Oh, right. I have, I have one last thing. If uh, you're watching this on Thursday, you can live th uh, stream something called the Golden Goose Awards. Uh, and this award that a number of scientific societies founded was in rebuttal to a number of politicians trying to highlight wasteful spending in basic science or like oh there's this study that's studying like how ants communicate how silly is that has no applicability to uh to life well the golden goose awards tries to find obscure research that has had strong applicability to other um uh, research areas has made a, a really big difference and and give awards to those researchers i've actually uh led a project that's been in one of those wasteful spending books so this one's near and dear to my heart. I only made it up to 86 out of 100, <laughs> so I'm kind of a little disappointed. But uh, I like this Golden Goose. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek and fun and highlights a lot of obscure research that's made a difference. So uh, check out the live stream of the award ceremony. All right. I think it's time for our next segment. The VR Minute. Virtual Reality. This week. I love the music on our show. Hey, have you been able to get back into VR now that you're home? I had, there's so much other things to do. I've set it up, um, and I just haven't launched it yet. Set what up? Set up this, the, the Vive again. Oh, it was D set up? Yeah, it was D set up because I was going to bring it to the Arctic, and then oh. it didn't. the weight didn't work out. Yeah. So Got it. it was in bags. We're only a couple weeks away from Oculus Connect. Yeah. Are we starting to get a hint of what, what's going to happen there? Well, uh, I mean, the hope is that there will be a lot of new games announced support for Oculus Touch and also an Oculus Touch announcement for price and availability. Uh, that's the big thing right now. I think everyone who owns an Oculus Rift and they've been selling them uh, wants to know when they can buy Touch. And, and also going forward, whether Touch and the Rift are going to be considered. That's that's the 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 package going forward. Any price leaks so far? Well, in the UK, there are a couple retailers who've shown pre-orders between 180, 190, and 200 pounds or euros. Oh, so in the 200 dollar range. No, uh, that's more than 200. It, it is, but typically the things are more expensive there yeah. with with, with uh, tax and duties. So you get basically it's the same numerical value um, overseas. So 200 dollars, I think, is definitely on the high end of what we'd hope these things to be. No, because it. Because that's the price difference between the Vive and the Rift. That's why it's the high end. I don't think it's the high. It's like the it's the maximum it could be, but it's also my expectation. I was hoping for 150 and expecting 200, and oh. I would have been pissed at 250. I was hoping for 150 with game bundles, and oh. there will be game bundles uh, to yeah. bundle with with the touch. I think there will be. Like you know, get a couple games at launch. They've I already. Think they're they, gonna have to. Do, they've already they announced medium to. would be. Bundled. Medium would be bundled in. Yeah. I mean, I think with touch, uh, one because it's tough to then say build a computer, buy a computer, VR. We want to keep momentum going, get more people to own the Rift. But 
not fragment our audience and really start focusing energies on what I think we all agree to be. We need we need positionally tracked controllers to be to be the to be the, the gaming the pr the primary gaming experience and VR experience on all these VR platforms. It's interesting that you suggest that it, they could make Touch Plus Rift the only SKU going forward. I hope so. I know before, in, in the interest of selling rifts with game pads, like that's and, and getting games out there and being yeah. out in the marketplace, they were saying they would support both going forward. And I totally agree. There can be some games that you don't need touch for, like you know, uh, space simulators, Lucky's right? Tale. Yeah. Lucky's Tale, Lucky's Tale, like, and continue making those games. But I think that's not mutually exclusive with the idea that touch would be the only skew going forward. And I hope I hope that's the case, and that's why I think that at eight hundred dollars, that would be that's, that's a lot. I mean, it's it's also what the Vive costs. Yep. So and, and I, I have no idea how those are selling. Like, do you guys feel that there is a little bit slow down the momentum of VR uh, in the past couple months? Yeah, and I I sort of point to the fact that there hasn't been well m many killer games that have come out mm -hmm. that have been that have driven the conversation. I'm I was sort of expecting PSVR to rekindle a little bit of that yep. here. And then we saw the PlayStation announcement and they didn't talk about VR at all. Yeah, I mean, that's still so, coming out. That's still on the roadmap. There'll hopefully be a lot of games. And a lot of those games will support Move and lot won't even need Move. But an advantage, of course, from the PSVR side is the controller is tracked. And I, that helps a lot. Um, yeah, so even if you just have the camera and the headset, you still get a track controller. Super Hypercube, you don't need track controller but having that there to know where the buttons are uh, increases immersion yep. makes it more fun you're not just a floating ghost head looking around um, and then also uh, recently you we saw some uh, uh, I don't know if we call it a snap with some feedback from the community about the pricing of some of the games so insomniac released their game feral rights we, it, we talked about it being pretty expensive it was uh, 50 bucks 50 right? bucks um, maybe it wasn't selling so well so they immediately scaled back now its new official price is, um, what is it, 20 I thought 30 but 30 you're right, 30 And then they also did, in addition to that, a 60% uh, off. Yeah. So it was $10 for a short period. And for people who had paid the $50 for it, then they threw in a bunch of games. Seven including games? Including The Climb. Yeah. No, that so, was a great deal. I mean, that was a good, solid gesture from their part. I mean, I imagine a lot of those people may have owned some of those games already. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could gift those to I don't think you can. Well... Uh, still a, a cool move on Oculus's part. They got Air Mech Command, Damage Core, Kronos, which mm -hmm. was... Cr people love Kronos. Yep. That gets high marks all over. And Edge of Nowhere. Yeah. Damage Core is part of this, too? Yep. Oh. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a great bundle for... And, and that is a good bundle. I think it, bundles make a lot more sense when there's a lot more content. And when we had that initial burst and we do have things coming out... You know, it takes time for developers to make quality experiences, and hopefully, a lot of the developers and a lot of the big, you know, uh, big publishers are spending time in VR making uh, things that work with track controllers. Because if, if you're going to tell Insomniac make make three games for next year, I would love for them to be all track controller games, uh, take full advantage of VR. This problem of not having a whole lot of killer games is the argument behind Oculus funding titles. Because it's a chicken and egg problem. If there's not enough people to buy your game, you're not going to invest the budget into making them. And so I think Oculus took the reins on that and invested just a ton of money in seeding development. And so that's led to some pushback, unfortunately, from a lot of the gamers who want to see cross-platform titles. But because Oculus you know, seeds the funding, they actually they get the titles first, which makes perfect sense. I mean, I don't think you can have your cake and eat it, too. I, th I think the people who are upset about that have to look at both sides. Yeah. Uh, Oculus Connect is October 5th, 6th, and 7th. That's only a few weeks away. I don't think that Oculus Touch is going to unfortunately come out that weekend for the public, mm. but rumors are that it will be as early as late October, which that would be great. That's it, still be, be in time for holiday season. If they announce it and they say it's like two weeks out from from Oculus Connect, that's fine. Yeah, that would be like an Apple move. The problem is if they're like, at Thanksgiving, like, you know, six weeks later. Like, American Thanksgiving, not Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> mad, Canada, about last night. Um, you know, they are pretty gung-ho about their touch launch. They, you know, um, they've said in public forums that 
judge us on this launch, not, yeah. not the last one. And uh, hopefully we can judge them on titles that will be new yeah. and not just ports of things that we've already seen on the Vive. That's a dangerous th- uh, thing to set up to saying judge us on this launch because there's going to be something that's not going to go yeah. perfectly right too, and they'll get pilloried for it. Jeremy, when can I play budget cuts? Well, someone – this is this is very thir- secondhand. Okay. But – a gamer wrote the developers behind Budget Cuts an email and said, hey, I loved your demo, as I do. I mean, everyone loves the Budget Cuts demo. For me, it's still one of the best experiences you can have on Vive. Um, and they said, uh, you know, when can we expect the full game? And they wrote back saying, we're hoping to have our full launch of Budget Cuts done before the end of the year, if not early next year. Mm-hmm. So that's actually a lot sooner than I expected because they – I think that they're involved with Valve now very strongly. Maybe they're an internal development team even. And Valve tends to allow their teams whatever time they need to finish when it's done. So, and that, that says to me that it wouldn't be this soon. But that would be awesome. That would be. Yeah. What if they come out and say, surprise, it's Portal 3? Yeah, that's, that's the joke. I mean, it, it, it's, it could be that. I mean, it, it won't be. But it, it, it's that good of a game. Yeah, I, I hope they spend the time making, like, being creative in their level design, and you know, not need to rush out something that's a shorter experience that they can just, they can spend more time on polish. You know, it's I don't think of it as being that scary of a game, but that's a game that my nine year old won't play. As it's, as soon as he gets scary. to the robots, yep, he's like, um, nope, there's, I'm out of here. There's tension. There's yeah, a lot of that's what it is. Tension. It's the tension. It's not like jump scare. Yeah, it's more of like I'm afraid of those robots. What if they come get me? Yeah. Terminators. Do, do, do. Testing this week. Hey, what have you guys been testing? Hey. I like I like your watch, Norm. Oh, I don't actually like your watch because I have an Android watch, but it looks like you have a shiny new thing on I do. Uh, I have the Apple Watch Series 2. You're such an early adopter. No, I'm not. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Um, you know, it's only been about a week with this watch, uh, and I didn't wear the Series 1 for very long, so it's tough to tell the differences. I know what the, I know what the differences are. There are things to me that feel arbitrary in the differences between the Series 1 and Series 2. Um, and I think it's very fair to say at this point, if you're interested in the Apple Watch, one, if you're, Apple Watch isn't something that's going to convert you from Android to Apple. That's a given. It's for it's to sell an additional multi hundred dollar accessory for people who already own and, and love the Apple ecosystem, whether they have a Mac or an iPhone, an iPhone especially, uh, or an iPad. Um, but if you want or curious about Apple Watch. Last year was probably the right time to buy one. And Why? I know I know everyone says buy second generation Apple products. Yeah. This is not the second generation people are waiting for. I think they're gonna have to wait another year at least to series three for the big jump in something to, to solve any of the early criticisms of Apple Watch. So l- let's dive into it just a little bit. And because yep. it looks good. It I looks have to okay. say. I, I you think know what it just looks okay? I, I like that leather band. The band a lot. is great. I love them. I think I chose the I, I had good taste and chose the best looking band uh, that they had. Um, no I, one questions your taste, Norm, yeah. especially in your co-host. <laughs> so the form factor hasn't changed at all, right? It's actually a little bit thicker. They, it's You can't say that they did not make actual hardware changes to it because not only is there a new processor, but they also changed the entire speaker systems to make it waterproof. And that's a lot of engineering. Um, but it being the essentially the same form factor and a newly milled thicker chassis for the forty two uh, for the series two um, tells me that they are stuck whatever because of whatever hardware constraints because you need to get the battery in there you need the screen to this form factor you're not going to get a Apple Watch anytime soon that's going to be a circle screen or anything that's going to remove the fundamentals of this shape this form factor and this UI interface just make it slimmer. Like that, that's, that's that. If people want both new features and slimmer, we're at a point with battery power where that's a real hard thing to accomplish. Yeah. And so, do you have expected that in the second generation? Was because I'm really, really optimistic. Have you had real world 
battery life increases that make a difference because battery has been a huge limiting factor for smartwatches. So this is still a charge once every night device. I what? did a uh, couple your, your t- typical use, you know, use it normally as you would to get emails and notifications, and it's going to go a day and a half. Uh, stretching it out, it goes from basically a full day and then up till 5 p.m. for me the second day, and that's when it's at 10%, and it says I just need to be in low power mode and just show you the time. Um, a full day of use from 7 a.m. to evening gets you to about 50% battery life at night and you decide not to plug it in. Uh, if you're not wearing it, it doesn't take a lot of power at all. It's really when you're wearing it that it sucks power because it needs to do the tracking of your heart rate, you know, your GPS, and also that's when you're flipping it on for the screen. This is essentially no difference or no real... No real effective wor- difference. I don't think Apple is going to be in that market where they're going to try to get they're going to design a watch to be that you can only charge um, once every other day. That's not a benefit to them. I think that they're going to be in that comfortable one day of use, but you still have to charge it every day. And in, and then they would make it maybe even lower capacity battery, more efficient processors. Um, the battery, the thing that sucks with the most battery is really the screen, you know, and, and the latency between um, the screen turning on when you flick the wrist is, hasn't been improved. It's still not as immediate as I, I would like it to be. Um, the arbitrary feature I talked about, the ability to scroll the crown to see the time without flicking up your wrist is, is nice, and I've used that a couple of times because I don't want to drain the battery. To clarify, it actually raises the brightness subtly as you scroll up. As I scroll up. I hadn't seen that before until you showed me. And that's a feature that's, I think, arbitrarily limited to series two there's no reason as a software feature that couldn't be put in series one um the gps is nice uh i think it's gonna what's gonna boost the value and the usefulness of apple watch is once the airpods come out one last thing that i hope you do uh if you haven't done already i'd really love to see you put it through the paces and waterproof not by swimming i would love to see uh your thoughts about using it in the shower yeah and for that i need a different band so this band is not the waterproof band, and, and I can get a sports band, um, no problem. But uh, the first watch is fine in the shower. You can swim with the first watch in the yeah. swimming pool. Oh, you can. You, the new watch can go to fifty meters, so you can go diving in the new watch. Oh, I I thought it was like water resistant. Go, don't go in the pool. No, no, no. people you, swim you with could, it, and people oh. have, have showered with it. I think. Never mind. I don't need you to try this out in the Let's shower. Let's build though. that carousel rig. Uh, uh, is it a carousel? Yeah, oh, the, the, like the dunking rig? The um, the Ferris wheel. That's what it is. Yeah. The Ferris wheel water rig and just like churn it through and simulate the swimming. Because who wants to go swimming? Well, you you mentioned the AirPods being the big thing that this is waiting for. Yeah. Have you tried out the AirPods? I did. I got a chance uh, this past weekend also to try out the AirPods. Where did you try those? Um, I know someone. Rad. Um, His name's Tim. <laughs> Uh, what, do you think? what do you think? God, I so I can't publish a picture of it. Mm-hmm. How many of them have you lost? No, I, I have not lost any. Uh, but I could not take a good-looking self me selfie of me wearing them for the life of me. <laughs> yeah. So, well, tell us about the experience. Does it sound good? Uh, sounded okay. Okay, which um, is all I could and, and it wasn't. It, it was not a testing environment. The thing I wanted to see was one ergonomics, whether it would fit. You know, shaking your head, not for running. You know, it didn't feel loose. Two, you can definitely f- feel the 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 rod that comes out of it against the side of your face. Um, and so it is what it is. That's the design. They needed a space for the battery, and they needed a space for the antenna. Maybe it'll look better in the future, or a little different in the future. Uh, but really, the the thing that I wanted to try out was the pairing system, and being able just to flip open that case. Mm-hmm. Um, which looks like a floss, a, a box of floss, basically. Uh, and then that charges, you know, having the extra charge in that, but then taking the AirPods out and then seeing the pop-up on your phone, that was neat. And then knowing that that works seamlessly between the watch and the phone in that kind of connection. Uh, so if you're playing music on your phone, it automatically s- goes through the AirPods. Uh, that was also neat. I think the case is the coolest part about those earbuds because it, the fact that that acts as a charger, I think, is ingenious. Well, it, it then 
they they made the case an essential part of it. So I'm curious why they didn't yeah. make the case a more of a thing that had you know maybe not a keychain hook, but is a thing that you wouldn't lose that you can have. You know, you can't actually stand it up. Mm-hmm. The case is something I guess you keep in your bag or your pocket, but it's not something to put on your desk. Uh, some, not, there are no flat uh, other than the the front and the back. The bottom isn't flat. I think it's curved. Some blogger, maybe for The Verge or Nine to Five Max, suggested that the case should have a headphone jack. Then you could have, you know, basically a wireless headphone jack wherever you go. Wait, but the case doesn't send a signal, a digital signal to the earbuds. No, no, no. But it would. You're, I mean, if you'd put the earbuds into the case to charge, you could then listen to a standard headphone by plugging in a headphone jack. You know what I mean? So the, you would need then to route the audio from the AirPods yeah. to the case. Yeah, exactly. Then to your analog headphones. Mm-hmm. I'm just it's, trying to get, a good idea. get the headphone jack somehow. Um, I just I don't like the molded plastic earbuds from anybody. Right. I I need the silicon. You know, the kind of lock out all the world. Uh, get that full base. Some people like the hard, like the built-in, the stock Apple earbuds because they do let in other sound. Like you can still hear the world around you. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for in a headphone. And I would love to see Apple, you know, go down, make some different styles of earbuds. Probably Beats. It probably will be Beats. So they got the new, um, the new sound chip in the Beats headphones. Yeah. Um, I tried a game that's two years old. It's called Shovel Knight. It's on Steam. It's on a lot of things. It was a Kickstarter, and it's an old, like, 16-bit style Castlevania Metroid game. You know that's a genre now? They call it Castle or Metroidvania? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's but, great. Um, and it's it's super hard. I am really proud of myself for finishing it pe- this past weekend. Um, and it's, it's it's a lot of fun if you know you want to challenge. It's got elements of like Zelda 2 where you're walking through a town. It's got top-down maps like Mario 3. And it's got the main action is more like Castlevania. And it's pretty fun. It's it's got the best music. Uh, I knew you were gonna say that. If yeah. you like chip tune style music, this this is um, the artist is Vert, who you know from a lot of other titles. But my God, this is just like the most pro chip tune style music. And it uses an extra couple voices that were apparently only on the Japanese Famicom. We didn't have it on the on the U.S. domestic systems. So it's just it's just phenomenal music. Awesome. Cool. Anything from you, Kishore? No, I have a few plugs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I guess if you could rewind time, I'm giving a talk on NHL 94, the history of that video game. But I guess I'm giving it tonight, which is after this wow. podcast drops, um, which should be fun. Uh, let's, let's have that as a segment next week, your talk. I love that game. Can, can we watch your talk online anywhere? Uh, it's being videoed, and it'll be out on Vimeo sometime. All right. So I'll link to it. Uh, the... Other thing I want to plug, we, we're going to be announcing some stuff soon. I w- uh, one of my jobs is I work on the Bay Area Science Festival, and that's coming up. And we have a pretty killer lineup that's uh, going out, including a tested live show yeah. that's returning. Please stay tuned for more information okay. about We'll see an announcement about show. that um, really soon. Uh, but more pertinent to this podcast, I am slowly catching up to Jeremy and Twitter followers. I have closed the gap to... a. Less than 150. Oh, you're going to get me. No problem. It's fewer. It's coming. It's coming. It, oh. I, yeah. I had a nice run with the pin sim, and then that was it. Like, it's just, I think you're just on a constant rise from all of your awesomeness, and I had my little blip, so. I think the Canadians are going to take their revenge on me. <laughs> <laughs> Unfollow you? Yeah. All right. Allo bots. Nothing but bots. That's it for me. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Kishore. Jeremy, anything to plug this week? Uh, no, you can follow me on Twitter, though, yeah. <laughs> at Jerware. It's at J-E-R-W-A-R-E. And uh, Jerry and I did shoot a video earlier this week that... Um, yeah, that's why I'm sunburned, by the way. Oh, really? Um, I wasn't even talking about that. I was talking about the other video we shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's... You did some... an outdoor shoot? We did. Yeah. We're doing another. We're doing hey. outdoor, shoot, outdoor shoot. Yeah, we have two shoots coming up this weekend. Oh, what's coming up on Tested? Uh, we have some projects coming up, uh, some stuff I can't talk about. Uh, there's some embargoed stuff coming up soon. That's all I can That's say. That's cool. Like, <laughs> what I think it's important to let people know. I know there's been a lot of podcasts up. Uh, we're starting to fill the queue again. You're gonna start. Yeah. You're gonna start to see a lot of stuff come out on YouTube. Yeah. 
Uh, and the timestamps are going to be effed up this week because Allo crashed my phone, which is how I keep track of when thir- certain things are. But they'll right. be close. Thanks, Allo. Well, thank you guys for listening. And uh, here's an outro this week, courtesy of... Yeah, pronounce that. I'm not going to pronounce it. Crash what of you guys? Thank- Hi there, I didn't see you. Test it. Excuse me, Professor Hoffman, what was that? No, I left the inmates in charge of the asylum. That's true. Test it. Bye. How, where can people send new outros? Uh, they can email, oh, they can post them in the forum. Just go to search on Google Tested Podcast Outro, or they can email them directly to me, um, Norman at Tested. We need more people. Yeah. We love you.